Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Cinephiles. We are reposting our conversation on Aliens, the 1980s film here. We brought in our special guest, Michael Vogel, to be a part of this, you know, one third of the Geek Buddies. For the three of us, I am the outlaw, John Roca. You are? I am Steve Morris, and I am very excited to talk about one of my favorite action movies of the 80s. Absolutely. This one directed by James Cameron. And, you know, we were talking, for those of you who don't know, we also reposted our 1979, uh, our discussion on 1979's Alien the other day and went into a discussion about comparing the two. And near the tail end of our discussion, Steve said he had an epiphany about aliens. And I'm did. really curious to hear what his epiphany is. And if you want to set it up, Steve, please feel free and then get to the epiphany. So well, with the way I'll set it up, you know how we've talked for years about mm -hmm. the problem with diehard sequels. And the problem with Die Hard sequels is that once he's you have an ordinary cop put in an extraordinary situation, and we discover that he is extraordinary in all yeah. of these ways and the most kick-ass person in the world that you never want to mess with. And that makes it hard to do the sequels because we already know that about him. So you can't recreate our ignorance about how awesome this person is. What my epiphany was is that it's like Alien and Aliens does the same thing, but they do it in two movies, not one. Mm. Because... Alien, because it's a horror movie structure, is always about being outmatched, you know? Yeah. And it's always about we're really scared and we're just fucking trying to survive this. And she does survive and she demonstrates incredible strength of character, but an incredible resourcefulness and courage and all the things necessary for her to survive. But she just barely survived. That's what that movie is. Mm. Whereas Aliens, she goes toe to toe. You know, Aliens is where she becomes the hero. It's not just she's an awesome person who figures out how to survive in an impossible situation. It's there's all the Marines who are supposed to be the heroes are failing. I need to be the one to take charge and kick ass and in the end, literally go toe to toe with the queen, mm. you know. And so what happens is it essentially gets you to the same place where Ripley is like John McClane and Die Hard, like the toughest person in the world. And I think that creates... I, I think what's interesting about Alien, the Alien franchise, mm. is that it's almost like it has to recover, figure out who it is without Ripley. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's part of the trouble of figuring out what makes this work. Yeah, and the inspiration for us doing these introductions is that Alien Romulus is out in theaters now, and I, I certainly loved the movie and enjoyed it, going back again to see it in IMAX. For sure, I look forward to hearing what Steve's thoughts are, because he hasn't seen it yet. But I know, but there are some allusions to aliens in the movie, but I think Alien Romulus, as I said in our intro to Alien, has much more of a connection to Alien. That being said, there are some nice fan service moments in, in uh, Alien Romulus that connects to aliens. And Aliens is such a damn good movie. And I, and it's going off your point you just made, Steve, as I, as you were talking, I was thinking of something came into my mind that inspired by what you were saying, because you look at Alien, when does it come out? 1979, we're just surviving Vietnam. We're about to get the Iran hostages like this uh, Jimmy Carter's first term. There's there's this feeling that America is overwhelmed by the world, like it's overwhelmed. There's a sense of terror. There's, a, you know, the Cold War is still going on. There's so much that is happening here in our world in 1979. That's a completely different world in 1986. Ronald Reagan is president. The yuppies are around. Wall Street is out. There's this feeling of like there's this feeling of America, you know, and so that radiates all throughout Aliens. Yes, is the oh, action yeah. great? Yes, is Ripley being back as the alpha female fantastic? Yes, do we have a great villain, Burke, that uh, that Paul Reiser brings to life? Do we have great quotable lines from Hudson and from Hicks throughout the movie? And of course, you said, Steve, leaving, leading to that one great line from uh, from uh, Ripley, you know, uh, you know, uh, get away from her, you bitch. All of that is there with some great comedic moments and awesome action sequences and a little bit of the body horror stuff. But it's much more about we can go toe to toe now. Yeah, we can handle stuff now. Don't you sense there's a difference in the approach that Aliens is trying to accomplish versus what Alien was reflecting back to us about our world? Aliens is reflecting something completely different now. Well, it is, but it's also the failure of the Marines to handle what they think they can mm. handle. You know what I mean? Great it's point. It's like we, we set up. Hu hubris, yes. Well, and, and starting with, you know, sort of what I mentioned in the intro to Alien is like the totally naturalistic, realistic, nuanced, very grounded characters of Alien. Yeah. As compared to the, oh, this is the tough woman. Oh, this is the arrogant, per you know, it's like yeah. the, the and, and again, it's not a, 
it's not a criticism. James Cameron, obviously, we can make jokes about unobtainium and things that are <laughs> and King of the sure. World and things where he's a sure. little on the nose, but like he he is good at creating mm. a oh, I get who that character is. Yeah. Oh, I get oh that that's the corporate asshole. I got I got it. You know, like the, and that's a really important writing skill. Mm. And then you put these ensemble characters in the box, and then what an 80s movie does as opposed to a 70s movie. Yeah. A 70s movie, you don't know where it's gonna go. Right. And this person you might set up that this is their conflict, but then something completely different happens and then they disappear because that's how life is. Right. An 80s movie is like we set up this conflict and then we resolve it. And we deal with each person gets their thing right. and them getting their thing is this great, satisfying feeling. And that's what, I mean, I, I you know, that I think you can't overestimate. That's what's so bizarre. I think this is unlike anything in any of cinema really mm. is that having a movie and a sequel that are equally beloved, which yeah. I think they are, and yet are completely different. It's not like Godfather and Godfather two or star Wars and empire strikes back yeah. where they're evolutions, yeah. but they're totally within the same world and the same characters. And this is like a nuanced seventies horror film yeah. and a balls to the wall eighties <laughs> action movie. And yet they, ha they are connected and they're hugely influential, but they are not influential of the same things. Alien influences a whole other set of movies than aliens. Does. Yes. Right. And you throw in Newt, which is an, it's absolutely like something that is perfect to make the audience and, and uh, some of the mothers care about the film as well. Like it right. appeal to a more female audience in that respect, which is a fascinating approach, but you're right, Steve, that it's a subtle commentary about the hubris of America in certain situations, right? Cause the Marines can't handle what's going on, but they die nobly. They all almost all die nobly. Uh, even Hudson at the end there dies nobly by trying to kill all the aliens before they, they take him out. Um, and they come together to, and, and it's Ripley. They finally have to listen to Ripley, the female lead of this thing. They actually do have to listen to her because she does know what you're talking about. She suspects the stuff with Burke from the beginning and then, and then it, it comes to fruition. So it's also a commentary about like respect, respecting women in the workplace. If you can look at it in that way as well. So there's a lot going on in this film, but look, to push that all aside, the action sequences are awesome. The yeah. uh, the uh, designs of the characters, the incredible walls that you see with all these uh, characters, all the, sorry, the xenomorphs and all of that, it's fascinating to explore. And yes, these characters that are the Marines are memorable. There's a lot of quotable lines in this. So top to bottom, it's an enjoyable, enjoyable movie. But what it's going for is completely different from what yeah. 1979's Alien is going for even if the spirit is somewhat still there, what it's trying to do and show us is completely different, but it's no less effective, as you just said. No, it's a hugely influential and important movie. And we obviously had a fantastic yeah. conversation with Michael Vogel about it. Uh, and, and I think what's interesting too is for him, I actually think for Vogel, this movie is even more important than it is for me, certainly. And I actually mm. think for you too. Yeah. Like this sounds like this was in the, the Vogel household rotation. Yeah. <laughs> over and over and over again in the same way that, you know, Die Hard was in my rotation or something. Right. You know, yeah. and, and that's the interesting thing too. And it, and it sh points to why people have continued to go back to this property. Yeah. And I, this is the thing that we brought up before is like, how many great movies do you need to have a series that's going to come back to over and over again? The answer is very few, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's like, I think Star Wars and the Empire Strikes Back are both great films. And then there's a lot of other movies, <laughs> you know, and people like some of them and don't like other ones. Yeah. The same is true with the alien franchise. I, but although frankly, I've seen three and four, mm. I've never seen Prometheus or any of those. Oh, wow. So this will be my first going to Romulus, which by the way, I think I'll go see it. And I think this is an, our next cinephile short. Yeah. Because so th that's a good way for people. If they want to hear my reactions to this movie, which mm. I'm afraid will scare the crap out of me, <laughs> that they will go to patreon.com slash the cinephiles and they can check out a cinephile short that we're going to record on it or go to Apple podcasts where you can also hear our cinephile shorts. Absolutely. Well, let's not waste any time. Thanks for listening to this intro. Let's get, let's go back in time to listen to the conversation here that Steve and I had with our special guest, Michael Vogel, as we broke down 1986's aliens from James Cameron. Get away from her, you bitch. <laughs> Hello 
and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where each week we enter the world of a great film. We explore its themes, its history, the filmmaking, and the influence it has on us today. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. I'm John Roca. I'm a voiceover artist, uh, host of numerous shows here in L.A., and occasionally an actor. And today, we are very happy to welcome back Michael Vogel, who's an animation executive, a producer, a writer, an expert on all things comic books, and an expert on the film we're talking about today, which is Aliens. Michael, welcome back to The Cinephiles. Thank you very much, and thank you for that introduction. I didn't know I was an expert on Aliens, but now I know why you invited me, so that's good. <laughs> it is well documented all over the internet that mm -hmm. you are an Aliens expert. This is supposedly the staple of the Vogel household. It is. No. I will say that growing up, uh, my brothers and sisters and I were introduced to the Aliens franchise at probably a way too early age. But <laughs> what, it is. What, uh, what age is that? Uh, let's see. Well, Aliens came out in eighty. What eighty six? Eighty six. Aliens. Scott aliens Shout out yeah. Scott Mance. Yeah. Uh, and I believe like uh, eighty eight was when we watched eighty seven or eighty. Like, wow, like as soon as it came well, out. How old were you in eighty eight? If you don't mind me asking I mean, that question. Steve, a woman, a woman never tells. <laughs> well, you did say that you were introduced at too early in an age. I'm uh, trying I mean, to I, I think I was 11 years old. Wow. Is there 77, 87, 87, 87? Yeah, 11 years old. Yeah. Uh, and my brother, and I was the oldest of four. Yeah. Um, everyone saw it? Yeah, everyone saw it. Well, my parents, uh, actually, interesting story. I, I remember this story. They, uh, when it came out in theaters, were very excited because my parents had loved the movie Alien, and they went to the movie theater in Gainesville, the Oak Small Plaza, yeah. for any Gainesville people listeners. out there, <laughs> uh, any Gainesville listeners today. Uh, they went to the Oak Small Plaza to see it, and they were super excited, and about halfway through the movie, right as the tension, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, the tension is really ratcheting up, all the power in the theater went out, and oh they, my God. they were like, just pitch black. So, I mean, everyone in the theater started screaming and freaking out because, like, you're watching Aliens for the first time and the power goes out. And I remember them telling us that story after we subsequently watched it on That's awesome. VHS or beta or whatever we had at the time. And did they? Did you see Alien before? Or no. Did, so you didn't see Alien? No. I, uh, I, I saw Aliens uh, and then subsequently went back to see Alien, which is probably why Aliens is my favorite out of the mm. franchise. I respect Alien, and I think it's an amazing piece of film, but nothing for me in the entire franchise beats Aliens. Wow. Well, unlike any other sequel I can think of, they are in completely different genres. Yeah. They're related. Right. But they're... they're so So if you like action movies more than horror movies or horror movies more than action movies, that's yeah. why you're going to like one more than the other more than anything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm yeah. definitely an action movie junkie, so that yeah. makes sense. John, how did you first come to the film? Well, I think I, I came to it as when I came out in the theaters. Uh, I was old enough to go with friends at that time, and I had just started to explore film, so I had rented the original, which is probably why, like Michael just said, the original for me is my favorite of the two because I like the nuance of the original. We covered it already on the cinephiles, and so for me, I love it. But this is a whole other ball game, and it, this is one of those rare movies, rare sequels that expands the universe of the first one in an effective way and so for me it's always been a great one to come back and watch over and over again and yeah I've always kind of put it down a little bit as a crowd pleaser but you know there's a lot of nuance in this film that I had forgotten about and re-watching it again um, I really discovered the joy of the film and the pacing that James Cameron does I would argue this is his best script that he's ever written for any of his films 100% and, I think that's true right because every scene is effective every scene is powerful and so for me it was a great one to revisit over and over again at that time with my friends to go back because back then you could go for like four bucks or six bucks in Virginia and go see a movie over and over again sure. and so for me it was so much fun to see it it was, it was such a joy to expand the universe in such a great way and such memorable characters and I think that uh, you know having been an executive for several years and now writing as well yeah. I think when you get in a group of people and you're breaking story I, I think almost without fail, whenever you're dealing with a massive amount of characters, whether it be a bunch of Transformers, a bunch of ponies and yeah. my little, literally whatever you do, when you're talking about how do you establish a huge number of characters quickly and well, Aliens almost always comes up. Wow. Because the way that they establish the characters of all the soldiers, yeah. uh, including your core cast, but I mean down to like, you know, Apone and Gorman yeah. and everybody, like oh, the yeah. level of characterization and the completion of a story arc mm -hmm. that here is a character that is here at the beginning and this thing happens at the end. And even if it's in two or three scenes on multiple character fronts, you are satisfied. Yeah. And I think that like, so that comes up quite, quite often when you're talking about good storytelling and good characterization. It's funny. I'm kind of interested in going a long trip down the path of how aliens 
influences My Little Pony. I think that's a, <laughs> that's a great discussion to have, uh, but not one we're going to have but, today. But on another day. <laughs> um, uh, for me, uh, for those of you who haven't listened to our podcast on Alien, mm-hmm. first of all, I really recommend you go and listen to it. Yes. John, it's one of John and Mike's favorite. We had a great time talking about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And it, in there, you would hear how my sister scared the crap out of me by telling me the Alien story, which is why I did not see Aliens in the theater. Mm-hmm. I didn't see it for several years later until finally someone rented it, maybe when I was in college in the late 80s sometime. Yeah. And then, and I think I saw it before I actually saw Alien. Um, and then it, it was just one of the staples. You go to the video store and, oh, let's pick up Alien again. Yeah. We went, rented it over and over again because it's one of those movies, particularly from the late 80s, um, where it's just, it's quotable. Mm-hmm. Every moment is like, a, you know, you're going to cheer at these moments. It's such a, I really think this is one of the archetypal action films. Like this, along with two that we've already done, yeah, Die, Hard Die Hard and Ra- Raiders of the Lost Ark. Like this establishes what the modern action film is right. going to be. And I would argue Lethal Weapon in there, too. Sure. Just to throw it in the, in the mix. Yeah. So we're super excited to do Aliens. And unfortunately, the reason that we're doing Aliens yeah. is, is kind of sad and, and really shocking, which is that Bill Paxton passed away suddenly. I think it's after complications from surgery. Yeah, heart just, surgery. Yeah, just last week. And yeah. it's just 61. 61. 61. 61. Yeah. That is, you know, as a guy who's 48... <laughs> that is not far from me and it is really upsetting and scary and he seems like such a great he's one of these actors that is in so many films yeah. over my youth and even recently yeah. like it's really sad well and you really i mean it was you really he's one of those actors that you know when you hear the news you all of a sudden realize how impactful he was yeah. you know there's oh, certain yeah. people that when you know when you hear of their passing it's just like they were huge you know they were huge everyone knows they were huge bill paxton is one that came along and you were like wait what yeah. and all of a sudden you just sort of go through weird science aliens terminator true lies terminator yeah. uh and actually you know one of the things that i saw online that was I, I didn't quite think about it, and then it was true, is Bill Paxton is the only guy to get killed by a Terminator, a Predator, and an alien. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I would really recommend uh, that Mark Maron just did an interview with him like yes. a month ago. Mm-hmm. If you want to learn more about Bill Paxton, I would totally recommend listening to it. It's a really good interview. And what you hear is that he's this really kind of down-to-earth, mm-hmm. practical, working actor guy. Mm-hmm. And not, you know, doesn't seem based on the interview to put on a lot of airs, doesn't have a lot of arrogance. He's like, this is the job and this is how you do the job. And this is what a lot of people said about him in interviews. And Kurt Russell, though, said one thing that's really powerful. He said, Bill, the thing about Bill Paxton is people see that about him, that he's this nice guy, down to earth guy, but he was never satisfied. So he's always driven. Right. And that's a positive to have that combination mm-hmm. of keeping your feet on the ground, but still knowing that you want more, that you can get more of a performance. And that that is what's what's so great when he shows up, even as, as recently as Edge of Tomorrow or Live and Die, sure. Repeat, whatever that you want to call that movie. He was great in that Titanic Tombstone. He shows up and, and he like solidif- he like he's one of these actors that was kind of close to becoming uh, a main lead. But he whenever he shows up now as he got older, he was always good at like establishing a tent pole in the ground and, and laying a good foundation from which you to for you to bounce off when you were watching a movie. Even in True Lies when he's playing that car salesman guy, oh, like he's so, so memorable, good. right? He's, so good. He's so different in all these parts that he plays in simple plan. He's fantastic in that if, if oh, no yeah. one's seen that. So yeah. Well, and then bringing it to aliens, I yeah. mean, you know, they're just such a great organic level of levity yeah because you're not you don't want to put a bunch of like jokes and zingers into aliens to cut the tension because that wouldn't fit but his arc and his character steals the movie yeah i mean one of one of the highlights of the film is his performance as hudson it is and it is right on the edge of Mm -hmm. being too far yeah and he is so that guy and come on he is at the most quotable thing in the movie. Yes. I mean, over and over again, er, you know, everything he says is something you got quoted with my I mean, friends. Honestly, and you know, even though it was very sad, I turned on Facebook, uh, you know, in the morning that, that I heard of his passing, and I think every other post was game over, man, game over. Game yeah, over. yeah. Well, and so I like sad. what I like about him, what I liked about his character in Aliens too, is I've always felt that it was um Chet grown up like Chet from Weird Science after <laughs> after he sure. did, after he'd well, had he'd been in military school or <laughs> yeah. something, right? He, he actually went in the military before went back in and ends up on this. Went into hunt. suspended animation yeah. for a couple hundred years. That, that is that is now forever gonna be part of my fan <laughs> well, canon well, in life. Just, it's, it's, so, it's, just, it's very derivative of what he does with Chet, but in a way that's more accessible. Well, it's funny that you say that because Weird Science is what got him this part. Oh, really? Yeah, it came out right before. Obviously, oh, no he, surprise. he had he had actually worked as a in, in the art department with Cameron on a Corman film. Wow. That's where they had first met. Then he got, and, and so 
Paxson, you know, he has an interesting trajectory. Mm-hmm. He started born in Texas, kind of decided he wanted to be an actor, came to L.A. knowing nothing, yeah. doing working as PAs, working as runners, doing stuff like that. He got his first acting gig on a Corman gig yeah. literally because the actor that was supposed to play the part didn't show up. And they say, hey, can we shave that kid's head and make him the part? And that's his first role. <laughs> wow. He was working like in the art department or something. Yeah. That's where he met Cameron. Then he went back to New York, wanted to actually learn the craft, went study with Stella Adler. Then he was like working on an oil rig and decided to just make his own movie, casting the guys who <laughs> were working on the rig with him. And then eventually came back to LA and started to book parts. And he worked with Cameron, obviously, in Terminator. Mm. But it was weird science that came out right before they were casting Terminator that Cameron saw, and that's why he ends up. It's oh, the part of Chet. So, so you're right on the money huh. about that. I didn't know that. How interesting. Well, and, and what's great about the role of Hudson is that in addition to being a very funny part of the movie, yeah. in addition to being a standout character, it, his role actually really supports a lot of the underlying stuff that makes Aliens great, oh, being yeah. a, a male macho soldier who talks a big game. Right. And when the pressure hits doesn't have what it takes whereas Ripley is scared shitless to go back out there but when the tension hits I mean this movie is really about uh, how how do you actually react like how do you think you're going to react in this situation and how do you actually handle it and his his role pretty much nails it. And I think one of the undercurrents why is because I think he is he is essentially the audience. The audience is not Hicks. The audience is not Ripley. The, most of the audience is Hudson freaking out that these things are coming after them. And so how would you react? Yeah, you want to think you're going to react like Ripley does or like Hicks does. But in actuality, a majority of us would probably react like Hudson. Like, what the hell's going on? Yeah. What the fuck? Where, where is this coming from? Holy crap. Because oh, you, you're trying to recalibrate yourself to what you're seeing. Yeah. Or, I mean, all these aliens with, with acid for blood, like, yeah, this is the first time you're experiencing this shit. Like, no one's going to be like, well, let's figure this out real quickly. You know, it's, 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 it, I think that's why he endures so well as well. It's one of the, and it's one of the keys to the movie. Yeah. Um, so let's get it, let's get it in the movie. Let's, so first of all, obviously, Alien comes out in 79. It's a big hit. And right away, Walter Hill and the other producers, they want to do another one. Mm-hmm. And uh, F- Alan Ladd had been the president of Fox. He, he leaves, new people come in, and they're not interested. Hmm. And so suddenly you have this huge hit, and nobody wants to make the sequel. <coughs> um, and, and then there's arguments over the rights to the film, arguments over, over money, how much the movie made. Strangely enough, the movie studio said the movie didn't make a lot of money. <laughs> what a shock. Yeah, it's shocking. And uh, after all that kind of gets settled, uh, they're looking around for someone to write the sequel. And someone read the James Cameron script for Terminator and said, oh, maybe this should be the guy. And he, so he goes, well, I don't have time to write a script for Terminator or write a script for Aliens yeah. because I'm going to go off and make Terminator. Um, and let's, I want to I talk a little bit about James Cameron. So he's another d- new director for us. Yeah. And James Cameron, man, he is, I think, I haven't looked it up, but it's got to be one of the top two or three in terms of gross box office directors of all time. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, it's, I think he... I don't want to say I might be wrong. I think he might be the top. I mean, he has the two number one Mm -hmm. films. That kind of counts. I mean, it's huge. I mean, Avatar and Titanic. And he's never made a a movie that didn't make money. Mm -hmm. The difference is Spielberg has so many more movies. Right. Right. My guess is, and maybe we'll have someone someone out there listening can can tell us how it actually ranks. My guess is Spielberg's one and Cameron's two, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But and he's a fascinating. You know, we talked about before. There isn't a, a real pathway of how you get to be a director. You know, and Cameron's like he studies to be a scientist. Then he sees Star Wars Mm -hmm. and drops out of school and says, I want to go make films. And he starts to make his first film. The first thing he does is take apart a camera to figure out how it works. Hmm. You know, he comes from this science, but he gets into special effects. He reads every book he can on special effects. And then he goes off and works for Roger Corman doing special effects. Um, And that's so he comes out of a mechanical, scientific special effects direction um and ends up working on piranha 2 and the director gets fired or something and he takes over piranha 2 that's his first directing gig because wow. he was that he, he was art department and special effects a totally different way to come into films <laughs> and then he writes this script for terminator and manages to raise the money for that um you know and 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 that's sort of where we come in with aliens which is he goes off to make terminator and the and he was about to start making it except dino de Laurentiis had a deal with schwarzenegger to do this conan sequel to do Destroyer. Oh. So Schwarzenegger, at the last minute, right before they start Terminator, had to leave. And suddenly he's got nine months off. And he goes, oh, I guess I can sh- I can write the Alien script. He writes 90 pages. And then Schwarzenegger's back. He doesn't finish the script. 90 pages got him about to mid-act two. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, Fox said, well, let's see the script anyway. 
And so he hands them an unfinished script and they liked it so much, which is crazy yeah. that they said, we'll wait for you to be done with Terminator. That's and if, crazy. <laughs> it, That's awesome. Isn't that crazy? And if Terminator is a hit, you can direct it. If and Terminator bombs, then boy, you're just going to buy the script. Thankfully for all of Hollywood and film history, yeah. it was a hit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I love Terminator. Oh, me yeah. too. Yeah. Well, and it, as far as James Cameron, I mean, I'm sure we'll get into more of this as we, as we kind of dissect aliens, but... You know, it's interesting because, to your point, I mean, he is a special effects guru of Hollywood. I mean, has, has just pushed the pushed the envelope on what you can do visually in movies, yeah. every movie that comes out. But I think one of the keys to his success that, that often goes sort of unsaid is from Terminator on, for a guy that is doing the most high-octane, high-special effects action movies in the world, it is all about female empowerment. Absolutely. Every yeah, single yeah, yeah. movie. From Sarah Connor to Ripley mm-hmm. to Jamie Lee Curtis and True Lies yeah. to Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio and to the best two, yeah. Natiri and Avatar. I mean, if you look at every James Cameron movie that comes to Rose and Titanic. Well, yeah, Rose and Titanic. Uh, yeah. you know, like like it is it is amazing that in an industry and particularly in a subgenre of that industry that is so often criticized for the portrayal of females, for yeah. the Trinity issue, for you're an awesome female until the hero comes the right. male hero comes in. He has Every single time just nailed these movies that take a female, keep her very female, Mm -hmm. but put her in the center of an action movie. And I think that's kind of fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, and the thing, too, about from what I've read about him as a filmmaker, one of the problems people have in dealing with him, and it seems like a lot of people have problems in dealing with him, is that he knows everything. Is that from Mm. starting with taking apart that camera, is that... He's dealing with the special effects people where he knows how to do all that stuff. Right. Camera, he knows how to do it. Editing, he knows how to do it. Sound, he knows how to do it. Like he knows how to build things. He, I, you know, it's like there are a lot of geniuses in the filmmaking world, but I can't think of any filmmaker who knows as much practical, scientific, how stuff nuts and bolts works than James Cameron. Yeah, I can't think of anybody. I think that's why people are looking forward to Avatar so much because, like, oh, what he's going to do with the sequels because he has all this incredible wealth of knowledge. And he's always seems to be, this side of George Lucas always seems to be, or ILM, always seems to be, like, right on the edge of the special effects, right? He's, he's always pushing the boundaries. Like, what we saw in Avatar, people had not seen before, right? And Titanic, what he was able to do with Titanic, build nine-tenths of the size of the ship. These are the kind of things that he does that shows you how much knowledge and how much love he has for filmmaking and so I think that's what you're saying Steve is exactly right we're going to see what he's going to do with these avatar films and people are just trusting that he's going to be able to do a great job with them because he knows so much absolutely and, w- and one thing and this is jumping the timeline a little bit but you yeah. can't do this without talking a little bit about James Cameron the naturalist scientist adventure guy because oh, after yeah. Titanic you know, rather than go right into his next film, he spends seven or eight years doing documentaries and doing yeah. all this undersea stuff and developing all these new technologies. And from everything I've read, and I am a little bit hooked up with, you know, through the Cousteaus and some other places that I've worked, he is no bullshit. Like, yeah. he is the real deal. Scientists respect him. And he is, you know, about four years ago, he went to the bottom of the Marianas Trench by himself. Like, mm, this is not, wow. the, this is, you know, it's the deepest point in the oceans. There are only three people who have ever been there. Yeah. And one of them is James Cameron. Like, that's an amazing... I mean, you think there are hundreds of people that have been top of Everest. Right. This is like one of the most amazing expeditions of all time, completely uh, run by James Cameron. He ran the bathysphere going down. He did all sorts of research while on the bottom. He took all sorts of film and went up. I mean, that's an amazing person. Well, yeah. it's an amazing thing. You know, I mean, people tell you all the time when you're starting out uh, as a writer, well, what, what should I write? And they say, write what you know. And fortunately for James Cameron, he knows everything. Right? Yeah, <laughs> apparently. Apparently he does. <laughs> All right, so uh, the movie goes into production. Um, uh, it's shot in England, apparently. And I've heard this. We heard this a little bit with George Lucas. The uh, British uh, crews, while uh, really efficient, well-trained, you know, excellent crew members, didn't necessarily give James Cameron so much uh, respect. Oh. They have a way of doing things. Well, they respected Ridley Scott. Yeah. And, he, and here's this young guy coming in, and he kept they kept kind of dismissing him and he kept trying to show them Terminator to show them he knows how to make a movie and they wouldn't watch it. And, and the way the British system works is that the DP, the director of photography, he's going to light the set how he wants and the director should shut the hell up. And, wow. Cameron, and so the first DP they had just lit all that beautiful set really well. Light coming in from the sides. You could really see all the detail of the alien you know, world and Cameron's like, no, it has to be dark. I want this lit by their by their headlamps and it's just really dark and really creepy. And he's like, no, this is how it's lit. So they fired him and then the whole crew rebels. 
And the whole crew's like, you can't fire him. He's one of us. Wow. And it was a real struggle. And they, you know, they break for tea time. And Cameron is not easy to work with. He mm. is a perfectionist. He's going to drive people. And he had resistance the whole way through this production. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I'm, no, it's funny. I'm just, I, I actually, I actually was just taking that in. I was like, I was just thinking about how so many of the movies that we love, I mean, you know, you, you have, uh, you have crews and you have, you have uh, shoots that are a dream yeah. and the movie's just not there. You know, you're like, oh, that right. was, that was a great experience for me. The audiences never came. Yeah. And you hear so many stories about these films yeah. where it was just a nightmare, but whatever the alchemy of that nightmare was, it produces something amazing. It's, yeah. it's kind of crazy. We touched on that in The Shining and we touched on that in Charlie, with Charlie Chaplin in Modern Times, this idea sure. of these Or Apocalypse kind of, Now. Or Apocalypse or, Now, yeah. right, exactly, yeah. Yeah, but it's, the, I mean, the opposite is also true. Yes. You know, because there's movies like The Princess Bride, there's movies where everybody right. loves each other and has a great time. And for all you filmmakers on there, I'm still telling you, that doesn't mean you get to be like James Cameron or Stanley <laughs> Kubrick <laughs> or Francis Ford Coppola. And particularly because the advantage that they have that you may or may not have is they're geniuses. Yeah. <laughs> you know, now you might be a genius, but don't just start going like, oh, being an asshole is the way to make a great film because right. that is not actually the secret. Right. Let's get in the movie. Okay. We start in hypersleep where we left off in Alien and Ripley wakes up and we find out that it is 57 years later. Yeah. By the way, do you think, uh, this has occurred to me watching it this time, do you think Paul Reiser, his character, Burke, purposefully told everyone not to tell her how long she'd be in hypersleep so he could uh, oh. like, ingratiate himself with her, with her by going like, oh, I can't believe no one told you. Uh, well, here, here's how long you've been. Uh, so she that's immediately a really established interesting trust. interesting point. Whether or yeah. not that's actually true, that would be great. Like that, that for Paul Reiser as yeah. an actor, that's just such a great like, I told everybody not to tell you just so you're going to trust me. Right. Like, and, and we as the audience, because the Burke is, huh. the, the, Burke is the big reveal, we as the audience kind of go with him because he says, I work for the company, but don't uh, don't hold that against me. I'm actually a good guy. So the whole time, he, he's not only establishing connection with Ripley, he's also establishing connection with us as an audience to trust him as a character. That's a fascinating... I, I never thought about it. And when you first said it, I was like, no, that's not true. And then, and the more I'm thinking about it, yeah. I don't know that it's true, but he's such a surprising villain. Yeah. The way that all of his betrayals, mm -hmm. because they, they, the betrayals, and we're going to get into all of them, of course, move from, and by the way, we should put out now our, this is a 30-year-old movie. We're going to spoil everything. So, <laughs> yeah, what but, are you listening for? But they, they, they move from kind of like, oh, he was naively evil. Right. To being, oh, no, he's real evil mm -hmm. um, in a very slow way. Mm -hmm. And so the... Man, if he was that evil from the beginning, well, when you find out later that he was in, I mean, he, he was. was he's the one that sent the colonists sure. into the situation yeah, without. He, he, I mean, yeah. he, yeah, I mean, whether or not his motivation was to subtly tell people not to tell him, right? He was straight up evil from yeah. the beginning. Once you get to the end, you're like, oh no, he was bad from day one. Yeah, he was, mo and he he's been just putting on a front the whole time, right? Well, but there's a difference. I mean, clearly, all his actions are terrible, right? But there's a difference between you know, what I would call remote control evil, where you're thousands of miles away yeah, yeah, yeah. and you kind of don't know exactly what the situation is over there and you don't give them the full info to uh, you are right in front of someone killing them. Well, as soon as he lets go of those face huggers in the room with Ripley and Newt when they're lying under the cot, that's that's the end. Like, that's, right, no, that's, that's full. That's, he has been full evil the whole time and that's how you know in that moment because he wants that money. I mean, money. we could spend an entire hour arguing degrees of evil, but I yeah. think that, like... <laughs> True. I mean, based on the timeline, like, in Alien, like, the company... "Quote unquote," the company has yeah. the information. Wayland Corporation. Yeah, yeah. It has has the has the uh, information on what's going on, and fifty seven years later, they sent colonists to that planet, yeah. right? Knowing those colonists were gonna get impregnated. Well, they right. don't know exactly what happened fifty seven years earlier. That's what they claim. That's what they claim. Right. That's what Burke's saying. Hashtag <laughs> alt facts. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we don't know what. The, and one thing, by the way, you brought up one of the other themes that goes throughout almost all of uh, Cameron's films is he is anti corporate. Yes, is between Cyberdyne Systems and Avatar. Yep. It's like he is he the the people the, he sees them as exploiters mm -hmm. and people that are dangerous. And sometimes that is handled in a fairly subtle way, and sometimes in a pretty overt way. And yeah. this one is pretty overt. Yeah. yeah. So Ripley wakes up immediately. She's having dreams about which scared the crap out of me. Oh, Her yeah. first nightmare of that thing coming out. Yeah. Oh, it's rough. Oh, which yeah. is, um, which is like as an eleven-year-old, horrifying. <laughs> yeah. 
Which is yeah. a great way to bring people who'd seen the original movie back into the right. back into the sequel too. Yeah. Um, but stylistically, we're already in such a different film. Yeah. It is such it, it is an '80s film, not a '70s mm-hmm. film. Like all the atmospheric and not able to hear dialogue and sort of nuance, realistic characters. Mm-hmm. That's not here anymore. We're like, here's the corporation. They want something out of her. We understand what that is. Yeah. The conflicts are really clear. Um, so that so the first thing they 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 claim to not believe her. They take away all of her rank and whatever. And then uh, we go into the scene, which is in the special edition director's cut, but not in other cuts, where mm-hmm. we find out that Ripley had a daughter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What's your feeling about that scene? It's interesting because I think. In retrospect, looking back on it, it gives you context on something that you actually, at the end of the day, didn't need context on. Like, right. and I, it's great. Like, I, I think it's a really cool scene. But watching the original movie as many times as I did growing up, this idea that Ripley kind of latches onto Newt and that there is a mother-daughter relationship happening here, yeah. you you know, like that scene is clearly there at the beginning of the movie to build that context. Like, I had a daughter, she mm-hmm. grew old, I never got to be there for her. Now Newt comes along. Um, but even without that scene, like that relationship with Newt and Ripley is so strong, and the yeah. and the the acting between the two of them, and just kind of the the nurture and care that takes place. Uh, it, it works with or without it, but it's a great context to have. And we see her maternal instincts with how she deals with Jonesy when he shows up back again in Aliens and also when he, how she deals with her, the cat, in the first movie. And so she has the maternal instincts already, so we don't need it. So the scene, I think, adds something, but it doesn't necessarily add anything that was missing, in my opinion. Yeah, I, it's funny. I think it depends on how, which one you saw first. I think mm. if you saw the, the original one first that didn't have that scene... That seems seemed sort of extraneous because yeah. there was nothing missing. You know, it's just as you say. It's like, and, and this happens a lot in screenwriting where you think like, well, I need to establish that somebody has this need. Yeah. And I st- and 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 then what you discover when you have actors doing things is you go, oh, it's obvious. Mm-hmm. It's all here. I don't have to have this scene. And so it's not that I don't think the scene messes anything up, but it's also sort of that. Oh, here's an important point. I'm telling you important character information. Yeah. As opposed to just. She meets this young girl and has a relationship with her. Right. So uh, Ripley goes off to do some work, and she's still having nightmares, and knock, knock on the door, and here comes our friend Paul Reiser, who, by the way, I think is great in this movie. <laughs> so good. So good. And he comes in and says, hey, we got some colonists on that planet, and something's going on. Can you come check it out? Right. Well, and this is like, and this is where I love when a movie does this is when the audience is with Ripley. Like you, you just lived through hell. Yeah, you lived right. through a literal horror movie. Right, and you make it back, and somebody goes, "Hey, by the way, <laughs> I need you to go back into the pits of hell." Right, and the audience is like, "Fuck no! Yeah, <laughs> like, right. don't, why would you do this?" Um, but it's interesting because this this is a whole movie about. Facing your demons and coming out on top. Yeah, I mean, literally yeah. facing your demons, and it's it's a it's an amazing moment where she like is finally like, I got to do this. Yeah. yeah, well, and 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 we also get to meet our uh, Lieutenant Gorman for the first time, our yeah. Marine, who says, "Hey, we're Marines. We can handle anything." Now, do you believe him in this scene? Oh, believe him in what way? Well, I mean, when you like, if, I believe that he believes it. Yeah. Well, well, that's what it's hard having seen a movie over and over again mm-hmm. that I can't go back and go. How did I feel when I first saw it? Mm-hmm. Like, do you go? When you first see it, wow, this guy seems really competent. These Marines sound, wow, that's that's great. Or do you go, I don't trust that guy? Oh, I, I trust. I trust yeah. the Marines. Yeah. I, I do. I mean, like, look, I think to, to, to John's point, uh, going back and rewatching Paul Reiser as Burke, yeah, yeah, yeah. you start to sort of maybe really overanalyze everything he does to right. see the manipulation. But yeah. as far as the Marines go, I mean, I think the Marines are all straight up honorable dudes. I, I don't think any of them are are lying or are, are over or like pretending. I think they all believe that they've seen some shit yeah. and that this is just more shit and that they are capable and ready and good to go and then just completely fall apart. Well, right? and I think that's what's so great about introducing Gorman in that way is Gorman is, is established as this lieutenant and the way he's like, thanks her for the coffee. He's very much by the numbers guy, but throughout the film, he's undercut until the end when he has his moment yeah. his his end moment which is great but like which is ironic because you juxtapose that with what happens with Paul Reiser's character we're introduced and we trust him immediately and then he his he slowly erodes our trust through the whole film and so it's it's fascinating to watch that with with Gorman because nothing about him initially in that scene radiates incompetent nothing Not at all, all. I, that's what and I so, think. and so for me I'm like okay cool and it's Reiser who's driving that scene it's the moment, Burke's character the moment that you get the first hint yeah 
of him being incompetent is when you find out that he's only done simulated drops. Yes. Right. That and that is and that even that is not you could go either way from that point in the script. You right. can either go, I've done simulated drops, but I actually am prepared for this. And right. then it's not until the shit goes loose a little bit, which right. we get to that, right. that he really you're like, oh no, this guy doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. And as a military guy, I would argue it happens just a little bit before then, Michael. It's when they're all having food and, and Hicks says, Oh, I guess the lieutenant's too good to eat with us. Oh, that's, good point. Good point. I forgot about that. One thing I've heard, and, and John, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, yeah. but from all the military people I've talked to, everyone I've talked to says that the most dangerous person to deal with is a new lieutenant. Absolutely. Is that the because you got non com officers mm-hmm. that are that are experienced. Yep. And you got, you know, higher ranking officers who have experience and you have this guy could have come just out of yeah. you know ROTC or something. And I think he's purposely picked that way by Burke. Yeah. I think he's purposely picked so he can be pushed uh-huh. around, manipulated and twisted by Burke because he does not have the strength to push back. And a pawn is under the lieutenant's right. thumb. Therefore, a pawn has to do with lieutenants, even though he may not like it. Like what we'll get to, but when he asked him to pull the uh, magazines out of their weapons, a seasoned lieutenant would have never agreed to that. Yeah. Would have never, he would have pulled his team out. The reason that I think Burke picks uh, Gorman is because Gorman's not qualified. And I, I think the corporation doesn't pick him because he's not qualified. I'm really going to subscribe to this Roca Burke thing is that he I, is way more of a manipulative bastard of course and a Machiavellian guy oh, than I'm, I'm ever already I'm, that's why that's what I was saying about <laughs> levels of evil like I think your theory that he's sort of a, 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 a quasi bad guy to real bad guy I think he is a straight up bad guy yeah. from the minute he shows up on screen to me the second that he has that conversation with Ripley later on in the movie when Ripley finds out that Burke was the one who signed the order to have those Collins go in there is the reason he's on that ship it is to save his ass make some money and get the fuck out of that corporation. He's a dirty son of a bitch from the wow. beginning to end. And that's, that's I, when you, you know go what? back and watch I think it. you're right. It's all there. Which also, uh, the other great character uh, in Aliens, which is Bishop. Bishop's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, his introduction, uh, particularly coming off of Alien, where mm-hmm. we had Ian Holm as our artificial life, yeah. Bishop's introduction with that knife thing yeah. is awesome. Yeah. Apparently, he he practiced a lot, Lance Hendrickson. Well, and, <laughs> wait, and just straight up, how many people did that with their brothers and sisters? Like, <laughs> None. We, no. Oh, yeah, we did that. We did that a lot in the Vogel household. <laughs> like, I don't like, think I ever... like, mom would stop doing the aliens. They're like, well, no, it's not just butter knife. It's safe. My, my dad was really good at it. And my <laughs> oh, dad, shoot. my dad would not only do it, but he would do it and not look. Oh, wow. On his hand, not on someone else's oh, okay, hand. Okay. Go, dum, 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 dum. Wow. No, it's a it's a great introduction. But the great thing about that is, you know, and, and they and they put it out there too. They don't they don't they don't beat around the bush. Yeah. Like Bishop is revealed to the audience and Ripley mm-hmm. that that he's an android. And Paul Reiser, again, playing up the I'm yeah. a good guy role, straight up gives the information. You never said anything about an android being on board. Why not? It never never occurred to me. It's just common practice. We always have a synthetic on board. I prefer the term artificial person myself. Is there a problem? I'm sorry. I don't know why I didn't even... Ripley's last trip out, the the artificial person malfunctioned. Malfunctioned? There were problems and uh, a few deaths were involved. I'm shocked. Was it an older model? Yeah, the Hyperdyne system is 128.2. Well, that explains it. And the U2s always were a bit twitchy. That could never happen now with our behavioral inhibitors. It is impossible for me to harm or by a mission of action allow to be harmed a human being. The shooter wants him. Just stay away from me, Bishop. You got that straight? And and Ripley flips out about it, but it's great because you are setting up this whole like, and and they do just, you know, throughout the movie, they are able to prolong the is Bishop legit or not Literally until the last scene. Oh, like yeah. I mean, you right. you are you as an audience are just not sure about this mm-hmm. guy, and, and and Lance Hendrickson plays him so sort of weird. Yeah, his fascination with the aliens, like you just don't know which way he goes. Also, when Ripley walks out of the room, one of the most quotable best lines in the movie, which is "Guess she didn't like the cornbread neither," <laughs> which is maybe my favorite line in the movie. Yeah, the um, well, the thing that's interesting is that. Great movies are ones that you can watch again and again. So yeah. the first time you watch it, you're with Ripley. Can I trust this guy? Yeah. After you've seen it, now you know you can trust him. And now you're watching the movie of, oh, Ripley doesn't know that he's a good guy. Right. Like Because now we know that he's a good guy. Right. I want to back up real quick. Just yeah. one, um, one interesting production thing is they go into the hypersleep. And when they wake up, they, there are all these people, 12... 12 hypersleep changers that wake, yeah. wake up, but they didn't have a lot of money. So they couldn't build 12 hypersleep changers. 
that's a mirror effect. That's a that's four hypersleep chambers wow. with a mirror on one side and a mirror on another, creating that infinity effect, and that's what it makes it look like. They're all those awesome. different chambers. That's awesome. And Isn't by the way, awesome? I love the way that they're introed, all of them immediately. You right. know, like I said, like I said earlier, like I served eight years. For me, how they introduce military characters in the film is really important to me. It's the difference between cliche and actual is so important. So in this, immediately you get Vasquez doing the pull-ups. Right. You get that other dude, the white guy, comes up does the pull-ups with her. Where's Besky? Where's Besky? Right. Hudson. You Hudson doing his stuff. Hicks doing his stuff. Apone, who's great. I mean, just a great, well, almost pseudo drill sergeant walk around going like, all right, ladies, get up. You know, what do you want? Breakfast in bed. That whole thing is and great. And also, and so many movies try and do this and they fail, but it is the, it's the, uh, you, you know, within one or two lines, you get this character. Yep. One or two lines, yep. you get this character. And, and you're just, you get them. Yep. Like you're, I, I got it. I got who they are. Let's move on and tell more story. And, and it's, it's so well done. And I always think it's a combination of three things, casting, writing, and acting in those scenes. Absolutely. Because you only have a little bit of time to introduce this multitude of characters so that you can feel their deaths when they happen. Well, most of the casting, it almost all happened in England because they're, they're shooting at Pinewood. Right. And so what they were looking for was either English people that could do the American accents. Right. Or Americans that happened to be living in England. And that's how they found Vasquez. Yeah. That's how they found uh, uh, Alpone. Who, uh, Alpone, yeah. Yeah, Alpone. Um, and he, by the way, had military service. So it's yeah, not It's surprising. believable. And by the way, he, uh, and you'll appreciate this, is there are all these people now handling weapons and they keep putting their fingers on triggers <laughs> and he will have none of it. That's right. Like, he's like, you do not do that. Never. You never know what can happen. So actually, here's a question then. Why have Ripley come? Because he, he needs her there to verify what they're doing and give a little bit of intel and information and reconnaissance on, on the subject matter that they're going after. She has been the only one that has ever confronted these creatures face to face. Therefore, he's using her for information. So he and, knows he knows he needs the intel from her, the information. Yes, yes. But what he's not counting on is that she actually has more balls than any of the Marines. Right. And, and don't forget, yeah. she's so frazzled when he meets her. She's so frazzled and goes back and forth about going. And he thinks, of course, and this could also be a, a misogynistic thing. He thinks as a woman, he can control her or he can push her around and do whatever. Well, and he hasn't seen the Ripley that we see. Right, exactly. We saw the Ripley who defeated the alien exactly. and escaped. Exactly. He hasn't seen, he saw a person dealing with post-traumatic stress and just right. terrified and messed up. And they all have only her word to go on in the report. Remember when she has a scene with those people around who doubt right. what she's done, they all say, there's no, there's no evidence of anything you're talking about. So she could have made it all up. I just told you <laughs> I blew it out the airlock. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, but no, like but, well, and, a and then there's that scene. But then subsequently, there's the, her first scene where she addresses the Marines. Yes. Where like yes. Vasquez is like, it's just another bug hunt. Like right. I just need to know where they are. And she's falling like, I hope you're right because just one of those things managed to kill my entire crew. Right. Like she lays it down, right. and even then they don't believe her. I think Apone's right. first moment, well, or maybe they just like, well, your crew's civilians. They're not tough ass. Exactly. Marines. Right. right. You know. And uh, and the the first moment where Apone shows her a little bit of respect is when, and it, it comes back later, is where she gets in the, uh, the loader, the loader, loader. Yep. Yep. and says, where do you want it? Yeah. Like, and that's, that's the first moment where the, the, the other characters in the movie see her as something more than just yep. this civilian who survived something. Right. Like she actually is being somewhat useful. And shows real competence. Yeah. yeah. Like it, it does, it seems in the way that scene is played, and it's a great scene, that running that cargo loader is in fact not easy. Yeah. yeah. And she does it really well. Right. Bay 12, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, I want to go back to something that you said, which is, is this just another bug hunt? Right. What does that mean? Because they've never seen an alien, these aliens before. They've never seen these aliens, but they say that, and then when they're having the meal, they talk about some kind of aliens that they had sex with, like mm -hmm. where you couldn't tell if it was a guy or a girl. So in this, just based on those two things, yeah. uh, it seems as if this is a universe in which there are some level of alien species mm -hmm. that exist, like, but they, they, anything that they have encountered, they've handled easily. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's the future. So bug and bug hunt is the term that you use when you're going off to look for insurgents or for anything like that, uh, like unknown, uh, uh, unknown occupation. Or unknown. when I open the cabinet below my sink. <laughs> Yes. Sure. Yes. Unknown opposing. Another. It's, it's another bug hunt. Another bug guys. Hunt. Yeah. It's another bug hunt. That's what the, it is. Well, it, yeah. it's just to me the the what is the nature of the science fiction world we're in? Always a little bit vague mm. in this movie. It's not a criticism of the movie, right, but right. it's like, and part of it goes to how they went into the alien area. Area is so cavalier. Yeah. And so, um, and it's like, well, what is your previous experience? Right. And how does that relate to that? We've missed a very important character as all of our Marines are waking up. Yeah. Hicks. Hicks. Michael Bean. 
But you know what? Actually, I'll give us credit for that. That's intentional. Yeah, because he yeah. didn't do I mean, much. He he doesn't do much with nope. with Vasquez doing the push ups and Hudson being Hudson mm-hmm. and a pone chomping on a cigar. Mm-hmm. Hicks is sort of just super casual, so casual in fact that when they do drop onto the planet, he sleeps the whole he way. Sleeps, yeah, which is great. So they really just it's like he's almost flying under the radar, mm-hmm. uh, much like Ripley and I mean you know, like you yeah. you have this movie filled with characters who are talking some big game and are not prepared, and then the characters who are just flying below the radar or yeah. are not really looked at as valued uh, end up becoming the ones that, that a survive right. and B right. save the day, the planet, the universe, the galaxy, take your pick. Well, and there's a reason he's a corporal right underneath a pone because he's a level headed guy that can handle and be in charge. But, and even as an actor, you, Michael Bean, it's a smart choice by Michael Bean to underplay because everyone else is overplaying. Yeah. It's just smart to stand out. And of course he'd work with, he's going to work with Cameron in the abyss and, and he'd work with Cameron in Terminator. So Cameron knew what he was doing with Michael Bean and knew how to use him correctly in these situations. So. Interestingly enough, not originally cast. Oh really? Who was it? Uh, it was James Remar. Oh really? Was supposed to play that part. What wow. an interesting yeah. choice. And they fired him. Oh, yeah, I can see may- why. Maybe it might have been because of drugs or something like oh, that. Oh, well, And maybe. so Michael Bean got the call from his agent, uh, which is kind of the call actors would always want to get. Yeah. Is your passport uh, ready? And he said, yes, it is. And he said, they said, you're on a plane tomorrow. Wow. That's how. So he didn't, like all the other actors had done military training together right. and, and had two weeks of data rehearsal and all this stuff. And Michael right. Bean just shows up on the set and starts shooting, <laughs> um, which again kind of makes sense to his character. Yeah. And by the way, I, I know he's a corporal. I get the sense that if he had been offered, hey, you want promotion? Probably didn't. No, exactly. Because when they say Corporal Hicks is in charge, he is like, yeah. He does not go, yes, I am. He does not embrace it fully because... It's not his jam, man. He's there. He took it because they, they they probably promoted him because like, they had to, which happens in the military. Sometimes you get promoted against your will. That does happen. And so you just kind of take it and you're like, okay, as long as I don't have to do much, I can make that money, fine. And I feel like that's his re- reaction when he gets promoted. So we're on the drop, uh, yeah. which is a great, is awesome. great, great sequence. And yeah. we're gonna now we're going to pull out all the guns and Bill Paxton has his gun weapon monologue. <laughs> they ripped me. Don't worry. Me and my squad of ultimate badasses will protect you. <laughs> Check it out. Independently targeting particle beam phalanx. Wow. For I have a city with this puppy. We got tactical smart missiles, base plasma pulse rifles, RPGs. We got sonic electronic ball breakers. <laughs> By the way, that's a like. Here's a whole bunch of exposition to yeah. hand to a character yep. that he makes hilarious. Yeah. Awesome. And there's that huge gun that Vasquez gets, which of is sort of half mini gun. It's and by the way, all the weapons are built out of real weapons. Right. So they built and remodified and combined weapons with other weapons. Yeah. That's um, awesome. And the way they built that is it, which is it's funny. I was watching it and I was like, I think that looks like a Steadicam rig, uh, and that is in fact what it is. <laughs> the way that she's moving that gun around is yeah. actually they modify a Steadicam rig, rig and mount a gun after it. Yeah. And that's what what makes it it maintains level and it and it balances all the weight across your body i was like that's awesome that is that's a very cool thing by the way shout out to that actress Jeanette goldstein because she was she was she's like she's in terminator 2 she plays edward furlong's yep mom and then she's in titanic as the irish woman with the two kids oh, really that's yeah. her no she is yep i think the character of vasquez is so important in film history yeah. It's essentially brown face, but I excuse it for this because she does such a great job that does not slip into parody or characterization or, or offense, you know, because she's not Latina. Right. right. Got it. Yeah, That's yeah, what I right. mean. She's not Latina. She's not Mexican at sure. all. She grew up in L.A. So that she had that Mexican thing with like accent. Well, accent. and again, and this is where I always go, what is this world exactly? Because yeah. they make the alien or illegal alien joke. Yes, they do. And I go, well, what is this world? It's, it's military, man. It's ball busting. It's right, but it implies that whatever, however many oh, hundred years in the right, future, that Mexico is still a thing. Mexico, that illegal <laughs> aliens coming from Mexico That's is a still good a point, thing. Steve. That's a good point. Um, I hadn't thought of that. I, what I'm wondering uh, in this film, and it continues yeah. to happen, is like, what? I understand why the Marines go in because we're gonna we're about to go send in the Marines. We're on this terraforming planet for whatever reason. Sigourney Weaver and Paul Reiser have gone down to the planet. Mm-hmm. I don't quite know why. And then they continue to move them in, even though his Paul Reiser's deal with Sigourney is, we're not going to put you anywhere near them. Right. And why the fuck does Paul Reiser want to go in there? Like, at this moment, mm. it seems fairly dangerous to go do you this. You know, it's funny, because that's one of those things that, you know, when you're when you're breaking a story, it's like, there's always the things where you're like, 
all right, there's really no justification for this, but we hope the audience won't go with it. And I've, it's <laughs> yeah. never occurred to me until you just said this. But yeah, like, I mean, they probably could have been communicating from the ship, and it's probably the way safer thing, given that, you know, you have these giant acid blood aliens. But okay. it always, but like, it, it never, it never occurred to me why they wouldn't go down and it just mm-hmm. sort of works because it's all you know you're, you're so wrapped up in what's happening and you know as an audience member that you want to get to the good stuff yeah. that you just sort of like roll along with it absolutely well this is as long as a movie's maintaining momentum uh we don't stop and ask questions yeah. it's, it's really where the movie slows down where our brains kind of go hey, why am i doing here well once again as I watch, to me, it makes sense that he goes down there because he is a control freak about this whole situation. So he wants to go down and there's, make sure those specimens are there, saved in the tubes. There's he, control freak, and then there's putting yourself... Well, that's fair. That's fair. Well, because of his I whole think, point, are these the, are the, he believes these are the most dangerous a- aliens right. in the world or in the universe or whatever because right. that's why he's doing this whole right, thing. Right. Therefore, he would want to stay the fuck away from them. Well, but I, yeah. do think, I do think, and maybe this justifies it a little bit, but I do think that... With everybody except Ripley, I mean, just as we were speaking about with the Marines, there is an idea that these are valuable right. military yes. assets that can be weaponized. Yeah. But there's a level of arrogance. Yes. So no Ripley, Ripley shows Absolutely. up. Ripley shows up and says, "Guys, this thing killed my crew." And to your point, you're yeah. like, "You were basically a bunch of garbage men." Right. So I'm sorry that this 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 scary thing ate the ate the other garbage man, and you barely got away. But right. like. We're professionals. Right. We're gonna handle this. So they, you know, we're we're kind of putting our knowledge on them. Paul Reiser didn't know what that thing looked like. No. No, you right. know, only Ripley did, and they only had her report to go by. Right. So I think they think I think he probably thinks he's pretty secure. He's yeah. like literally surrounded by a bunch of military men. Yeah. Right. Because they don't know what we, the audience, know. Well, and the motivation we can give him is his whole plan is to manipulate this situation to get an alien. Yeah. Well, he has to be there to do that. Right. If he's not there, he can't manipulate the thing this way. Um, I want to back up a minute because okay. uh, while, while Ripley is still uh, back on Earth, we, ha- we go to the colony and we go off with this family. He's going to investigate well, this spot. Not originally, but yes, in the special edition. Oh, yes. that, so that's special that's edition. Special edition yeah. ah. Originally, we see the planet for the first time when Ripley and the Marines do. Yep. Mm. But when you watch the special edition, you get to see the colony more or less working, and yep. you're introduced to Newt, you see Newt's parents. Yes. So you do get that first, uh, you, you see how things go down. Right. Because uh, Newt's dad has, cl- uh, has called in to say, am I going to get a bonus or my money? Because he finds the ship from right. Alien. Right. From so Alien. he's saying, I want to make the money if I get this money, you know what I'm saying? So they clarify that, and then they go out to look. And but course, yeah, but that is not in the original yeah, uh, the version. the face hugger on the dad. It's is- so funny, because I had forgo- I'd really forgotten. I'd watched the original a yeah. long time ago, and had just watched the special edition, so I thought that was in the original. No, no. And it makes sense, because you're right. We can just have it all be yep. off screen. I think it's more powerful to introduce Newt the way they introduce her in the, oris- in the original cut of the film, which is her running across while they accidentally sh- try to shoot her and they found her and find her in the vent. It just makes more sense. It makes more sense. And also, I think from a uh, from a character and visual standpoint, yeah. there's something really nice about, you know, when you do it the way that you see it in the special edition, you see Newt clean and nice yeah, and pretty yeah, yeah, yeah. as as a little girl. And I think what's great in the original with the way it works is you see her as basically like a beast. Yeah. I mean, like she is dirty. You can barely see a face in her and you Ripley literally uncovers her, you yeah. know, like, like wiping off right. like dirt and everything. And so by the time, like she actually does get cleaned up and we see her as a little girl, it's like, we've gone on this journey with Ripley. Yeah. Like I found this girl who's been through the same thing. I've been, this, this right. girl's lived through what I lived through. Like there's right. this bond between them and she brings out the humanity. She gets new to open up. She gets new to talk. And I think that, introducing her the way it was originally works better in that respect. Yeah, and you undercut the moment where she finds the picture of her cleaned up. Yep, in exactly. The dress, in the dress. Exactly. So you undercut that moment. Well, and I think that's a really good point. And the scene of her cleaning Newt up, it's really lovely. Oh, it's very sweet. It's really gentle. Mm-hmm. Well, and this is what makes, you know, even though Aliens is in a lot of ways the quintessential action movie, one, things that so, one thing that so many action movies lack today is letting the movie slow down. Yeah. Um, for a fear that you're going to lose your audience, for right. a fear that it's going to get boring or that it's going to drag. Mm-hmm. And Aliens has huge chunks when you go back to watch it yep. that are very slow, very expository, very character moments, but mm-hmm. they're so great and they're so well done that they don't feel like they're dragging the movie down. We don't see an alien attack until over an hour into the movie. It's an hour and 13 minutes hour in. hour and 13 minutes in. Yeah. That's the, Well, amazing. that's in the special edition, so maybe yeah. it's an hour in the other one. Yeah, hour it, nine or something. It's a, that's a long time. And this is, you know, we talked about when we talked about Khan, we talked about oh, yeah. it when we talked about Die Hard, is that I love action, mm-hmm. but for me... 
it's if it's just action, well then I could just you know fast forward and just watch action sequences. You watch Fast and Furious movie. Yeah, and and it's not that that's not thrilling and fun. Sure. Uh, but but it's like what makes to the movie last is the character stuff. Yeah. Um. So we've gone in and and at this point the Marines are thinking they found a hamster, they found a little girl. They're thinking there's nothing here until we go. Okay, let's go towards the cooling tower or whatever that is, mm -hmm. and suddenly we walk into this alien world. And a bunch of things happen at once. Right, yeah. Uh, first, to your point, we get our first look at the aliens in this movie. We get the first alien attack, and you know, if you were, and I mean, again, I saw it in the opposite way, but if you were someone who saw Alien, where this one mm -hmm. alien took everybody out, right? you get to this scene, and you're just like, just throw the towel in, you're yeah, fucked. Yeah. Get there, out of here. There's multiple aliens. Yeah. Like this is this is what James Cameron does so well. This is taking the first movie and just supersizing yeah. it. Um, you get to your point, Gorman suddenly out of his depth. It's Ripley who points out that they can't shoot because they're at the cooling tower, like that that's right. not going to work. Right. Then Gorman gives a pwn the order. A pwn tries to get everybody to do it. Vasquez doesn't listen. Yeah. I mean, just all the character stuff that you've built up for that hour all comes into play. And then ultimately, you get that great moment where Ripley just says, fuck it, and takes over. Yep, yep. To, because, because as scared as she is, mm -hmm. her need to be the person, like sh her need to rescue the others, her need to help where she can yeah. is greater than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And it's just thrilling. And we get this rare moment of Burke supporting her, saying like, you had your chance, Gorman, and jumps in the passenger seat, which is interesting. Well, in and to your point, when you, you just really, say, yeah. to your point, when you're really tracking yeah. Burke, yeah. He does need a level of protection. Yeah. Like he thought Gorman was going to be fine. I mean, to, to go to your theory of like right. if you're really going to track like from your your, right. your perspective of it, he's at a point now where he thought Gorman would be good because I can control him. Right. But Gorman is ill-equipped. Yes. And so in that moment, he actually needs Ripley. Right. He's emotionally incompetent in that moment, Gorman, and can't handle the, the attack. Oh, talk to me, hey, Paul. Gone. Get them out of there. Shut up. Do it now. Shut up! And Gorman, in a bit of frustration, yanks the the uh, comms off Ripley because he doesn't want to have his authority question because it makes him more embarrassed, even more embarrassed. He, it makes yeah. him feel even more incompetent. And you know, and another thing that's great is when you look at the pacing of Alien, where people get taken out sort of one by one in yes, horror movie fashion. Right. Yes. In this scene, oh. you take out over half the Marines. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. immediately. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just like they. It is. It is a massacre. Yeah. Yeah, it's and it happens super fast. Yes. And while clearly Gorman's decision to pull the clips and not to get them out, those are bad decisions. But those are bad decisions that happen in a matter of minutes yes. or seconds. Yes. You know, it's hard to make good decisions under right. weird circumstances. I mean, their whole way of marching into this place seems to be it was pretty foolish to begin with. I agree. Um, but then the rescue of Ripley taking control of that vehicle, which by the way is a, a modified it was it was used to do airport transports by oh. by uh by British Airways. Gotcha. You know, so it's one of those huge vehicles with giant wheels that drive around runways. Right. That's what it was. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that rescue sequence is great. Yeah, and, and that whole sequence with the aliens is fantastic too because it harkens back once again. It does enough um, homage to the original movie by having that girl come alive, pasted to the wall. Kill and me. Kill me. Right, say exactly what Dallas said when he was uh, in the wall. He said kill me to Ripley in, in the original Alien and so when the thing explodes out Ripley has her visceral reaction yeah. because of her dreams and then when they set it on fire you hear the sounds and the, what's great about the sounds is you don't hear it in real time you don't hear the sounds like from outside it, it, like real time in the room with them you hear the sounds through the camera and yeah, that's brilliant. It is brilliant. Because you can't see what the right. fuck that Another is. Another thing that's really important uh, within this whole sequence is yeah. that you see so you you see that what happened to the colonists. Yeah, you yeah, see yeah. that they've all been uh, impregnated. But when Vasquez wants to go back for her guy, that's... and Ripley says, you can't go back, he's gone. Yeah. Which is interesting because that's exactly what Rap Ripley does at the end of the movie. You know, like, don't go back, for like, don't go back yeah. with his loved one. He's gone. You can't right, go back. Right. He's done. He's impregnated. It's over. Right. But when Newt gets taken at the end, right. she's like, fuck this shit. I'm going in. That's mama bear. Well, there, it's yeah. funny. The, this is the answer to the question. This question has come up multiple times in this podcast. It's come up before. Why do we really need to bring Ripley along on this trip? Why do, why do they really need to go down the planet? Why do they go mm. in here? And the answer is because Ripley is the main character and <laughs> yeah, because right. she has to rescue Newt. Absolutely. And that's why it has to happen because that's mm -hmm. what the movie wants to be. Yeah. But what's you know? also great about her, though, is like she is a hero, but she's a hero that's very real. When she does the saving of them, 
she is grinding the gears of that thing, and Hicks has to, or uh, Hudson, Hicks, right, has to no, calm Hicks. her he's down. He's down. He's down. He's down. Because, because she's still lost in because fucking she's PTSD. Like, yeah, she's living some shit. Yeah, exactly. Well, and she, Ripley is going to do what Ripley has to do. Yeah, exactly. She does what must be done. Mm-hmm. She's no desire to be a hero. She is practical. And she's practical in Alien, yeah. and she's practical in this. But Absolutely. what Aliens really brings out, uh, which is great, uh, and this gets towards you know towards more to the end of the movie. But yeah. this relationship with her and Newt is great. Yeah. Uh, it's a very it's a, it, and again in a in a non typical action movie sense, they right. actually made being maternal yep. a heroic thing in an action movie. Absolutely. Yeah. But as my as my dad, who I've watched this movie with countless times, says. This movie, Aliens, just basically at the end of the day gets down to mother versus mother. It's right. not just oh, sure. it's not just Ripley and Newt. Yes. It's the queen, which is something that we had never seen an alien right. protecting her babies as well. Right. And that sequence at the end with the two of them, which we'll get to in a bit, is 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 like one of the best moments of acting with no dialogue ever. Absolutely. Sure. Um, so we managed to get out, and now we're going to have a conversation about what are we going to do? Do we use <laughs> some nerve gas? Do we go back in there? Do we nuke the whole thing? And I'm not sudden- sure Hudson's having a conversation, but yeah. <laughs> oh, dear Lord, Jesus, this ain't happening, man. This can't be happening, man. This isn't happening. All right. We've got seven canisters of CN20. I so said we roll them in there and nerve gas the whole fucking nest. That's worth a try, but we don't even know if it's going to affect them. Look, let's just bug out and call it even, okay? What are we talking about this for? I say we take off and nuke the entire site for Morbid. It's the only way to be sure. Fucking A. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on one second. This installation has a substantial dollar value attached to it. <sighs> they can bill me. Okay, look. This is an emotional moment for all of us, okay? I know that. But let's not make snap judgments, please. This is clearly, clearly an important species we're dealing with, and I don't think that you or I or anybody has the right to arbitrarily exterminate them. Hold on. Yeah, watch us. Hey, maybe you haven't been keeping up on current events, but we just got our asses kicked, pal. This is where Bill Paxton really yeah. starts to shine. Oh, He's, yeah. He had some really great moments along with everybody else, but it's yeah. after the alien attack <laughs> where Bill Paxton's performance turns into just pure gold. Yeah. And yeah, and this, and this is the moment where Ripley takes control. Yeah. yeah. Like, this is no longer a military operation. I mean, it is, to her point, and right. Hicks is the, Hicks is, but she's the one that points that out. Right. Carter is still trying to say, here's how things are going to go down, and Ripley's like, colonists gone, we're nuking this place site from orbit. Right. And Hicks has her back. Yeah. Well, and, and this is the suddenly Hicks, as we said, he was asleep. Yeah. He wasn't. Now he suddenly emerges as this mm-hmm. important character. And he and Sigourney Weaver, they have great chemistry. Yes. Together. Great chemistry. They really work well together. He always has great chemistry with his I love female Michael leads. Bean. Yeah, That's I know. Yeah. It just kind of fell apart after the 90s. It just didn't happen for him after that, which is a shame. Um, the other thing that happens at this same time is when you're tracking the whole Bishop piece of it. Oh, yeah. Is Bishop is dissecting the aliens. Oh, that's such a great right. scene. So a couple things happen here. One, if it's your first time watching it, yeah. this definitely leads towards Bishop is way too into these. He's right. fascinated in a way that makes me uncomfortable. Right. Um, which is how Ash was in the first one. Which yeah. is exactly yeah. how Ash was in the first one. So you're just like, oh, he's also bad. Yep. Um, but the other thing that happens here is they start to get into this conversation of, well, how does this work? Like, mm-hmm. there's an egg that impregnates someone that gives you the alien, but who laid the eggs? Right. And this is the first oh, time right. that idea, yeah. you know, that's that's not mm. an idea that's actually ever addressed in Alien. An alien, they just go in and there's all these eggs that they found. Well, wherever they came from, who knows? Right. This is the first time that anybody says, so how does this ecosystem work? Um. Yeah, exactly right. And And what we decide is, well, we're going to go back up to the ship and we're going to nuke the whole place. Right. Much to Paul Reiser's objections. Right. And so we're going to call in the, the ship. And I don't know how that alien got on that particular ship. Oh, yeah. But uh, that doesn't go very well. On the military helicopter. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then Hudson loses it. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's just fucking great, man. Now what the fuck are we supposed to do? This is real pretty shit now, man. This is this is where game over happens. This is game over. This is where it is. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. And this is also the great his other great line in this in this in this run yeah. is uh is Sigourney Weaver pointing out that Newt <laughs> survived way longer than that. Right. And he goes, "Why don't you put her in charge?" <laughs> Which is the best. We also get something that got quoted all the time with my friends is 
they mostly come at night. Yeah. Mostly. 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 <laughs> yeah. So we got to go back inside and we get an established a, a perimeter and a barricade. And, yeah. and this is where you see Ripley really shine. Yep. Because she is, much to what we talked about before, she's actually an officer. Yeah. That's kind of who she is. She And, and we knew this from Alien. Mm-hmm. Because in Alien, it was fairly clear that Tom Skerritt was going to make the decision to violate the um, quarantine. Yeah. And Ripley was one like, no, this is how you do it. Mm -hmm. And she's the one who really should have been in charge from the beginning. And now we, in Aliens, the same thing is happening. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's great here is, and again, just just the whole whole uh, Bishop-Ripley relationship is, this is where they figure out what the game plan is, which Mm -hmm. Ripley pretty much does. Yeah. And they realize that they can bring the ship from... Uh, up in orbit yeah. down mm-hmm. but it has to remote control and that you have to go out far away which Hudson is clearly <laughs> not on board to do right. oh we've got to get the other dropship from the Sulaco I mean there must be some way of bringing it down on remote hell the transmitter was on the APC it's wasted well I don't care how but we better think of something we better think of a way think of what we're fucked shut up we're doomed shut, shut up. up what about the colony transmitters the uplink tower down at the other end why can't we no, use it? I checked. The, the hardware in between here and there was damaged. We can't align the dish. And it's a great scene. Yeah. Because, like, Lance Hendrickson just, they're going, I'll go, I'll yeah. go, I'll go, I'll go. Well, somebody's going to have to go out there. Take a portable terminal, go out there and patch in manual. Oh, yeah, sure. With those things running around, you can count me out. Yeah, I guess we can just go. count you out of everything. Else. That's go. right, man. Hey, why don't you go, I'll man? Go. What? I mean, I'm the only one qualified to remote pilot the ship anyway. Yeah, right, man. Bishop should go. Good idea. But again, it's like you just see in Sigourney Weaver's face that it's like, okay, well, this is a great solution, but I still don't yep. fully trust you. Right, right. But okay, there's no better option. Like, they're yeah. just, they're in such a shitty situation. Right. Mm-hmm. But she clearly still doesn't trust this guy. Yeah. And one of the things you see in this in the Ripley-Hicks relationship is that she, he is very comfortable being the second in command. Mm-hmm. He sees instantly yep. in her that she has the leadership ability and he's like, okay, I'm going to be your executive officer. Yep. I'm going to fulfill and explain how we're going to do this because he knows more about the weapons. He knows right. more about all that stuff. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really well done scene. And uh, Bishop going in that little tube. Yeah. By the way, of all the alien stuff in this movie that scared me as a kid and how horrifying those aliens are, Bishop crawling through that tube, <laughs> still to this day, that shot makes me so uncomfortable yeah yeah because that is it's claustrophobia is central yeah yeah and we should say james cameron is was not easy on his actors mm. he wanted them to go through and do and i'm sure he put lance hendrickson in a very very small tube <laughs> but he put lance hendrickson through some other stuff later on which we'll get to okay but uh yeah it was it was physically tough on the yeah. actors over and over again so uh, Newt goes to sleep. They have a really nice scene between again yeah. between Ripley and Newt. She uh, she gives so uh, Hicks has given her a watch, uh, which is supposed to track her, and she gives it to Newt, right. uh, which is a really really nice scene. Well, and there's a beautiful there's a beautiful moment uh, that I just think is, is worthy of mentioning. It's yeah. that it's that moment where Ripley is being very. Uh, adult to a child yeah she grabs the head the doll of the of the uh the head of the doll oh this is great and and looks in there and says i don't see any monsters you know trying to be an adult kind of relating to a kid and newt straight up is like that's a doll yeah and it's a great thing because ripley in that moment realizes that she's treating newt as someone who is not an equal yeah much the way that she was treated earlier in the film. Yeah. And it's where she makes that decision that the two of them, like she's, I, I can't treat the, this girl has survived as much as I've survived. Right. Right. What's really funny about being a parent is watching strategies that used to work. <laughs> now fail. It's like, Oh, I can't play that game with you anymore. Right. You're going to figure that out. Right. You're too smart. But I don't want to gloss over this moment too, where Hicks gives her the watch because it's actually a very sweet moment where we don't have a romance in this movie, but that's a, that's a window into a possibility. They got a connection. Right? Definitely. And he, he, she say, he says, it doesn't mean we're engaged well, or anything. And she smiles. It's what you were saying earlier about uh, feeling that you need to write something implicitly when right. you're writing a script, and then once you get on set and you have these great actors, yeah. you don't need it. Uh, had had they slammed a romance between Hicks and Ripley oh, yeah, into yeah. this, it would have been so horrible, horrible. Right. But you know, you just said there's not a romance in the movie, and I actually disagree. Like I, I actually, oh, yeah. I fully accept 
uh, Ripley and Hicks as the romance of this movie right. because of that scene because yeah. it's so and tender the gun, and the gun scene and the gun right, right, right. scene the like gun he, scene is so yeah, intimate yeah. But, uh, but I mean you're, you're technically you're right well, no I'm just saying they didn't slam it in there like correct, you were talking correct. about but they do allude to it and you see it happening shades um, of it yeah. but it's all it's all that chemistry and, the, well. and those scenes are so well done because mm-hmm. the best thing is when you write a scene that's not about what you're like if Hi, I care about you. I right. felt that you had my back in there, and I really feel like there could be something between us. Like, that's awful. But a scene where you're like, I'm going to show you how to use this gun because yep. I clearly am worried for you and want you to protect yourself yeah. is not about that, but it actually is about that, which yeah. is great. Well, well, and you and you put them into proximity with each other where their bodies are close together, and, they're, and they speak in a certain way. And it's like, this goes to... It's the basic rule of show, don't tell. Yeah. That gun scene is so uh, intimate and romantic and sexy in this weird way yeah uh that yeah if they if they express their feelings for each other it would suck um things are all hell's about to break loose yep. yeah things are and, and what's funny is and part of it i think is this time that i watched i watched the special edition i will say that w- if, watching the special edition one it's a little slow getting to this point uh-huh i know you're looking at me like i'm a horrible person for saying it <laughs> but but i'll say from this point forward this is Unbelievably, well, it's an inter- it, it, it just gets to the nature of the way that we the Watch way the now. way that we imbibe entertainment now yeah. versus when we did. Like, um, a movie is a story, and I would wager that any story on the tenth, eleventh, twelfth viewing, you're going to pick out the parts that kind of drag a little bit. Like the thing that's crazy about Aliens, and the thing that they don't do today is, yeah. yes, absolutely, you're not wrong. When I watch Aliens now. Especially when it's someone who I'm with someone who's never seen it, and right. we sit and watch it, I go, shit. Like I told them that this was an action extravaganza (laughs) and we've been sitting here watching people talk for about 40 minutes. But the first time you watch it, like when you, you know, which none of us can really fully remember, but it's like the, the way the tension is ratcheted up. Mm -hmm. It's like the payoff is so big. You've been building and building and you had a little bit here and you had a little bit there. And then when all hell breaks loose, you are on a roller coaster until the credits roll. And it's from this point forward, I think Like from this point forward, it is going. We got Bishop at the transmitter, and we got Ripley and Newt waking up. I, for me, this is the scariest scene in the movie. Yeah. And it's an interesting thing because, look, as much as Hudson is clearly just – he's lost it, they do a really good thing with Hudson, which you've, you've had – Two solid scenes now of him just very comedically freaking out and not being a good soldier and not being able to handle it. But from the moment that Ripley and Newt are actually in danger up until his eventual demise, which is coming up very soon, he actually redeems himself. Absolutely. And this is where we get to this great part of the movie where a lot of the stuff that we set up with Vasquez is completely just dislike of Gorman. Yeah. Gorman's inability to control anything. Absolutely. Hudson's breakdown that he had. They all in this scene coming up... Every single one of them gets this amazing, really, really well done and really different moments of redemption. Yeah, hero moments. All no of them. question yeah. about it. In this scene with the facehugger, what inter- what's interesting to me is what is Ripley's great fear? It's not the alien. It's not getting yes, killed by good the alien. Point. Her fear is having the alien inside of her and her and exploding out of her. Right. That's what she's having nightmares for. So putting her in this room with the with the face hugger, mm-hmm. that's what's she's facing her greatest fear. Yeah. yeah. And also this scene more so, you know, an alien, uh, the 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 face hugger comes out and and just really quickly is attached yeah. to John Hurt. Right. Yeah. And um, anytime that we've seen them previously to this, you you don't get like. The, the creepiness of it skittering across yeah. the floor. Right. The, the terror of the tail wrapping around your neck and choking you. Mm-hmm. The thing that's the little fallopian tube looking thing uh. that comes out of its mouth that's like trying to just trying to get in there. Like this scene is it just it just takes all of the things that you were scared of from the first time you saw Alien right. and doubles down on all of it and makes it truly, truly terrifying. Yeah. And this goes to, A, James Cameron really understanding special effects. And another person we have to talk about is Stan Winston, is the mm. special effects uh, makeup guy on the film. And when you're seeing those little aliens, little facehuggers skittering around, what they're actually doing is they have a whole bunch of different ones that all have different skills. That one has been built to move against the floor. One has been oh. has built to have a tail that you can puppet. One's animatronic, one's mechanical. And they're all to do different skills that Cameron and... Stan Winston and the other effects people figure out how to work them all together. And it's like, it's, it's literally shot to shot. They're using different ones to do different jobs. And all the effects I talk about it was they would tell Cameron, you can't, this, there's no way to do this. And Cameron go, yeah, you could do it like this. And they go, Oh shit. 
<laughs> well, do it like that. And also a thing that always fascinates me, particularly with Aliens and, and some other movies from this era, is that, you know, we live in that CG age, you know, thanks to Jurassic right. Park and everything yeah, else. True. You really, truly, literally can do anything on film. Yeah. Um, but to go back to some of these movies where you couldn't literally do anything on film and see how they figured out how to do it. It's just it kind of like takes your breath away. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, it's really amazing. Um, so uh, Ripley, smart enough to use, you know, to light a little fire, use a lighter underneath the uh, fire uh, sprinkler. Hicks comes into the rescue, and it's still hard to fight off those little guys. Yeah. And then Hudson <laughs> cries, "Kid, look out!" <laughs> like, and now we now we find this is where we now find out the true evil yeah. of Burke. Yeah, because the it's interesting. I'm still going back to like you're right. I think he's planning everything all along. Oh yeah, but the but the impregnating and putting these people at, to into suspended animation to take this alien home. Yeah, that is a crazy level of evil. Well. Putting Ripley and Newt in suspended animation, and then... Wait a minute now, we don't know. Yes, the only way he could do it is if he sabotaged certain freezers on the way home. Namely yours. Yeah. So I'm going to bring back two aliens to Earth, which is the worst idea ever. Kill a bunch of other Marines. I mean, like, just straight up, like, the yeah. worst. Fuck! He's dead. You're dog meat, pal! And just as that piece of information comes out, we are on the run again because yeah. here come the aliens. The power goes out and all that kind of stuff happens. Yeah, and and it is scary and mm -hmm. scary, but also like they so they set up they do they do a really interesting thing here. So they set up the whole motion thing really really well yeah. because that comes into play really importantly later with Ripley and Newt. But also just that that tension. It's it's such a scary moment. Like the tension, like there are no there. 30 meters, yep. 20 yeah, meters, yeah. 15 meters, and the moment where Hudson's like seven. Six. It can't be. That's inside the room. It's reading right, man. Look. Well, you're not reading it right. Five meters, man. Four. What the hell? And like nobody can figure out. So you, the audience, like you're like, oh shit, they're right at the door. They're right at the door. They're like, wait, they're where? And it's that it's it's a completely disorienting moment because you're like, is it breaking? What's going on? Whatever. Right. And then it's that moment where Sigourney Weaver just goes. Eyes go up, yeah, and you as the audience go, "Oh my God!" <laughs> and because again, as you said before, in Alien, there was just one guy, yeah, and now we're seeing all these little dots and Hicks pointing his head up through that grate. Oh, so great, so terrible. That's one of my favorite shots. I mean, it's one of the shots that horrified me as a kid. But right. that shot of him shining that light and just seeing all of them skittering towards him is like. Yes, it's stuck with me. And one of the things the camera does that's so smart, he does it throughout, is that he'll have the camera upside down and have people crawling along the floor, mm -hmm. but then flip it so it's, they're on the ceiling, or he'll have people going downhill when they're going uphill, and all these things that to create that sense of strange movement of the alien, because mostly these are just guys in suits. Right. Yeah. You know? And yet, it, there really isn't anywhere in the film where I went, guy in suit. Yeah, no, it nope. does not feel that way. Like, like in Alien, you feel that moment when he stretches his right. hands out for yep. Dallas. That you, that's obviously a guy in a suit. But at no point in this movie do you feel that. No, way, and he's great. got way more. And, and and again, they're doing the same thing. They have different kinds of suits yeah. for different kinds of jobs. So sometimes it's a guy in a suit with the arms really flexible. Sometimes it's just you know kind of black painted uh, with very little detail because he knows they're going to be in shadow. Right. Sometimes it's a a mannequin, so you know that they can blow up. Or they would do things like when they shoot them, they have different chemicals in different pods. And when they had the squib, the little explosion happen, the two chemicals would meet, which would create that mist of smoke that would oh, fly wow. out like there's all this science and technology to wow. make because these are all practical effects yeah it's yep. not cg um and this run from the aliens is really scary yeah um and we got beautifully set up as i think you mentioned before vasquez and the lieutenant's death and gorman's death as a great death well, prior to that i mean hudson really gets his due yep. oh that's i mean, before, I mean right. hudson hudson is there uh in the room and just starts shooting Yep. everything and and finally just gets that moment of like well fuck it and he's like you want some of this you want some of this and even when the aliens come up from i think under the grade yeah, at that point grade, yeah. and pull him down yeah. he he goes down shooting he yeah. does so so you really do it's like i mean and this is why because if he were more you know to use another example of a cameron movie true lies yeah where he's just a coward throughout 
like Hudson has his cowardly moments, but he comes back. Yeah. And he kind of gives everybody that moment to get away. Yep. And then and then as you were saying, yes, Vasquez and Gorman, as everybody, everybody crawls through those tunnels because Newt knows the way. Right. And Newt, again, important, the little girl. There's a bunch of Marines here. The little girl knows how to get away from the She's aliens. She's the hero. Yeah. They're all following her. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then Gorman and Vasquez get stuck and it's like, you always were an asshole Gorman and they both hold each other's hands <laughs> yeah. with the grenade. It's like, they know they're going down. Yeah. And I think this is where all of these Marines, you know, for all that they didn't listen to Ripley, they didn't know what they were getting into. They didn't have it together. Like all of the things the Marines didn't do. Um, this is a movie where ultimately they're all really honorable yeah. and they all do help save, you know, like Ripley. And Newt wouldn't have gotten away without Hudson, without Gorman, right. without Vasquez at the end of the day. So it really does give them their due, which is what makes them beloved characters. Yep. They're great. And each of, each of them, it's what Cameron does so well, he gives them their moments. Yeah. Um, so we're running away and we get, we're going over these strange gear things and suddenly Newt slips through. Because yep. of Gorman and yeah, Vasquez. Explosion. Oh, because of the explosion. Yeah. That's right. That's right. I like Gorman. She, and she goes through. You an asshole, Gorman. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes down this slide, and apparently, by the way, that slide was really fun. Oh, I'm sure she, it was. She blew a few takes just so she could do it a couple more times. <laughs> and Cameron made her keep doing it. So we lose her, and this is yeah, this is pretty rough on Ripley. Water it's rough on Ripley, but also that shot again. To your point of different aliens for different effects. Uh, another another shot that yeah. from the very beginning oh, that always yeah. stuck with me is the alien tail coming out of the water oh, behind her. I mean, it's such a beautiful shot, but yeah. also terrifying. Yep. Absolutely terrifying. And now we've lost Newt. And at this point, we have invested a lot emotionally yeah. in that character. And we've invested a lot in the relationship with Ripley. And obviously, she wants to go back. But they got to run. And Hicks gets hit with acid. Yeah. Uh, and they use the acid really well in this movie. Mm -hmm. Like in Alien, they introduce it. And they yeah. pretty much never talk about it again. And now this is a really, really big factor. Yeah. In these, in these characters. And there's also a thing that I love about this movie uh, that that works so well, even though it shouldn't. And and it's particularly from this point forward is what happens is mm -hmm. James Cameron tells the exact same story from this point forward as Alien. Basically, yeah. I mean, mm. it it just supersizes it. Yeah. Alien One is, oh God, I'm blowing up the ship. Oh shit, my cat's back there. Let me go get the cat while the countdown is happening. Right. Oh, thank goodness we got away. Oh no, the alien's on the ship. I'm going to blow it out of the airlock. Replace cat with newt and replace yeah. spaceship with planet and you literally have the same thing. All the same stuff. But it works so well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and it's done in the action movie sense rather than in the horror movie exactly. sense. Exactly. Right, right, right. Um uh so so we we, we the dropship has come. Bishop has done it and there's really no question that Ripley's going back. Yeah. Yeah. And her making that super gun, however she does it. And just 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 metal and duct tape, man. Metal that, is, tape. that thing is awesome. Um, yeah. And her trip down the elevator into that. Hell. Yeah. That is one of the most dramatic action movie badass builds I can think of ever. And then we get to this part that, uh, that that I think is just one of the best moments, and it is the moment where, first of all, talk about reveals, the alien queen. Yeah, amazing. Something that now looking back on it in the history of geekdom, yeah, you can't imagine the concept of alien without the queen, mm -hmm. even though that's what the first movie was. But the alien queen, so important to the franchise, such an amazing reveal, yeah. just gross and weird. And again, to your point with the practical effects with her laying the yeah. eggs oh, and that milky yeah. fluid and everything and walking into what, you know, kind of a, as a callback to the first movie, walking yep. into just a, a room full of eggs yeah. and you get this reveal and you don't know what's going to happen. And you actually have like this, negotiation mm -hmm. happening between Ripley and the queen. I, I want to get out of here with Newt. I see your people. Yeah. You, I've got fire. Alien queen makes a noise. Aliens back off. Like this is a, yeah. this is a, I'm not going to kill your babies. If you let me get right. out of here with my baby. And then it's the, it's the, it's my favorite shot in the whole movie. Hands down is when Ripley cocks her head because she realized the queen's about to fuck her over. Yeah. Like, this could have gone down fine. Granted, I'm about to blow up the planet and you're on it, but you don't know. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to back out slowly. We're going to be cool. And then she sees the alien queen and like, <laughs> whatever she, she yeah. does. And Ripley just, like Sigourney Weaver, just cocks the head. It's the, 
a bitch. <laughs> Nuh-uh. And then just takes everything out. Yeah. Well, and this goes to, it's something that came up when we talked about Alien, and now we can confirm Aliens are intelligent. Yes. Like, they are not mindless. Like, mm-hmm. in, in Alien, you kind of go, well, is this, what is this? Right. And now, with that negotiation with the queen, clearly there's well, intelligence. Mm-hmm. The queen is intelligent. I mean, if you're going to go by the way that ants work or anything else, like, you're like sure. and, and I'm not going to say Which one Which they way allude the other, to in the movie. But, but whether the drones themselves are intelligent, up for debate, I think. Like, like I, I still am not 100% sure mm. on the intelligence level of a drone, but the queen highly intelligent yeah. yeah like 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 highly highly intelligent and once again a female once again a female led situation there on that side as well that the the queen is leading these absolutely these, these aliens yeah it's, it's very cool um i love this sequence because you're right mike it introduces this idea of an alien queen and anyone watching it and i remember the first time when this happened you just are like holy shit this is even bigger than you thought right just when they're able to handle the drones they up level you know they level up rather they level up to now the queen right when she says everything to fire you're like oh christ now what now what well and And it's the moment when the queen detaches yes that's where you go like oh "Oh, shit shit." and again i was gonna say shout out to stan winston i mean like the the alien queen herself is of all the things that stan winston has done in his career he's done a lot yeah alien queen is top five Hands down. Well, I don't know that I'm not sure because there are a whole bunch of people doing these things, so I don't want. But whoever, I know I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty yeah. sure. I, I mean, I might be wrong, and, and if I'm wrong, someone on the uh, on the on the World Wide Web can tell me. But <laughs> yeah, I, I do think the Sam Winston. I do think he was credited with that, yeah. and I think the the creation of her, the puppetry that went into her, yeah. everything that went into her, is just really truly fascinating. Yeah, it's it's 14 people it takes to run the queen. Wow, it's uh, she's on a crane. Which is, you know, so she literally, there's a crane behind her moving her around. Yeah. And then there's all these, one, one person on this arm, one person on this arm. There's people with animatronic things that are manipulating the head, yeah. manipulating the, the, you know, the interior mouth and all the, and all these guys have to do a dance together yeah. in time to make it all look, and it looks great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's really good. Um, and, and I love Ripley with the flamethrower and grenade mm-hmm. launchers and just blowing that. And those grenade apart. launchers like go into that milky sack. Ugh, like, yeah. Ugh. And she's cocking it each time. And by the way, Sigourney Weaver not only hates guns, but is like part of all these, you know, gun activist groups. I mean, she hates guns. Oh, interesting. Uh, and this, so this was not the easiest thing for her I'm to sure do. It's interesting. And uh, this was shot at Pinewood Studios. It's also shot at a big, huge power plant. Okay. Um, and this is the middle of winter, and all the guys shooting the film are in these big coats because it's really cold. And Ripley and Newt are in these, you know, t-shirts basically. Yeah. And she's carrying Newt and carrying two guns in this cold weather with fire and explosions and smoke. And this is pretty, it's pretty brutal. Yeah. Um, they actually build a um, dummy Newt, who so a lot of time when she has to move real fast and carrying her, that's not Newt. That's like a like a plastic dummy. <laughs> it's really convincing. Yeah, he, I, never, I would have never... Even when I was watching footage of it and them saying, this is the dummy, I was like, oh, man, that looks it yeah. looks really good. It's better than uh, that baby in American Sniper. I was about to say, like, <laughs> I literally was just thinking about that baby in American Sniper when Steve was saying that. I was like, well, <laughs> that baby grew up. That's right. It became <laughs> Newt. It became Newt. Wow. Uh, there's a lot of strange time travel in that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, then we get up to, we're going to go jump on our drop ship. Yeah. But, Bishop's gone. Well, and it, again, it's great because it's like this is where this is like where you get into like just James Cameron bonuses. Yeah. Like like where we had a great we had a great run with Bishop. Do we trust him? Do we not trust him? Nope. He came through. He got the ship. He was there. Like in any other movie, we're good. Yeah. Okay, great. Bishop is trustworthy now. And to get to that moment where Ripley comes out <laughs> and he's gone and. As an audience member, you go, he fucked us. <laughs> he oh, he was bad the whole time. Right. Like, some, that is some Snape level stuff right there. Yeah. <laughs> like where you're just like, wait, I just decided that I could trust you. <laughs> yeah. And and then and, and she's standing. The world is falling apart yeah. around us. Elevator opens. Ding. Yeah. Queen. Queen comes out. Close your eyes, baby. And then just at the last possible moment, there's the ship. Well, and, and to your point about James Cameron and lighting, I think one of the great moments of that Queen Alien is 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 the you know the elevator doors open and it's dark. Yeah. And then the 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 explosions happen, the light happens, and you just get that silhouette of the Queen. Yeah. I mean, you almost yeah. not, not silhouette, the little bit of lighting, but you just you can almost not see her, and it's like a nightmare came to life. Like it, it's yeah. so so horrible. And right then, Bishop flies back in. Yep. Yeah. 
it's a great moment. And now we think now we're really done, right? Right. Because we're on the ship. We're celebrating. The big explosion has happened. Bishop is a good guy. We're cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, nothing bad can happen now. <laughs> oh God! And then Bishop gets ripped, ripped in, in half. Half. Well, well, and before that moment is when it, there's something evocative of a chestburster in the moment when that big, you know, thing comes through his chest. Oh yeah. No, no yeah, it, it is. No, because you. It's a again, good, really good point. It's a yeah. great reveal. Is that is that Bishop actually does almost what John Hurt does, whatever. Like, like he, he kind of convulses yeah. and you see the chest thing. And the initial thought is, oh God, it's a, it's going to be another chest bursting. And it's the alien queen's tail yeah. that just shoots through him, yeah. lifts him into the air. And then she uses her arms to rip him in half. And so you're right. They, he's, they're still playing with that idea of the horror right. of the chest bursting, but then you're like, Oh no, it's way worse. Yeah. Right. And him getting ripped apart. That's a great shot. Yep. Um, and apparently, I mean, they built a mannequin, uh, you know, they did full face mold on, on but they Lance. didn't like it. So they really ripped him in half. <laughs> they actually ripped him in half. <laughs> Poor Lance. Um, and, <laughs> I've never seen myself ripped in half or a torso of mine like lying around right. covered in milk stuff, but that doesn't seem like fun. <laughs> no. And, and, by, and by the way, so the, the white stuff is a mixture of milk and yogurt. Of course. It's so gross. <laughs> and it apparently they had multiple cups of it sitting on the set, but they actually kind of went bad, but he's still putting them in his mouth. Oh. And then he got food poisoning of course. from them, but Ooh. then he had to go back the next day and just keep doing it oh. while having food poisoning. Oh, that is really. Rough. I mean, when I have food poisoning, I can't even eat good food. I yeah, can't just, imagine, like, like just here's that same thing, ugh. and let's cover your whole body with it. Uh, That's terrible. awful, awful. Um, but yeah, and then you get you know another one of the most quotable lines in the world. Get away from her, you bitch! It's one of the all-time greats. Well, and it's such a great moment too because. Newt's run away, and from what it seems like, Ripley has run away. Yeah, I mean, like it's and Newt is about to get killed, and you're like, "Where is Ripley? What has happened?" And if you haven't seen it before, maybe you've forgotten about that cargo loader. Yeah, because when she steps out with that thing, that is amazing. And once again, you talked about lighting. That lighting when the car, the was lighting on the that, but also right before that moment, uh, a couple things. A, the Alien Queen's hands are awesome. Yes, just mm. from a pure puppeteering animatronic like whatever they're doing the way they grip the crates and bring them up but also again getting to the alien queen's intelligence like she's not just randomly chasing newt like she figures out like i'm gonna pick this one up right. i'm gonna pick this one up yeah. you're cornered i've got you like it is a yeah it is a predator prey situation here and yes then the the door is open the lighting is dramatic <laughs> and sigourney weaver is ready to throw down yes yeah, so and i think that cargo loader is an amazing piece of technology because yeah. again that's real and the way they did it, there's a stuntman inside it right behind her, and he's controlling the legs, and they're each controlling different stuff, and oh. they have to do... So now, when she fights the queen, you got 14 people who have to dance together to make the queen operate, and you got her and this stunt guy, and that is a lot, and cranes and mechanics, this is dangerous, crazy stuff they yeah. have to do. And the choreography of it, uh, you know, with all that going on, to figure out the, you know, the alien queen is going to whip the side of the cargo loader with her tail. But, you know, she can't get to Ripley. Yeah. And Ripley is going to grab the queen's mouth and face, but the alien queen is going to use her other mouth. Her other yeah. mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's going to get right up in Ripley. I mean, just the choreography of that and playing on the biology of the alien, like the, the way the alien looks like, it's just, it's, it's an amazing, awesome scene leading up to Ripley going, Hey, it worked once. I'm going to do it again. Right. Let's go out the airlock. But in James Cameron style, let's supersize this. Right. To the point where I am literally holding on for dear life to the cargo loader that is jammed in here. And the alien queen has my foot and oh shit, what am I gonna do? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's 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 a perfect climactic moment, mm -hmm. and it is. We talked about it with Alien maybe being the first fourth act that we could think of in film history. Yeah, this is the one that sets the tone of this fourth act thing. Yeah, yeah. this set up this set it up for every movie throughout the eighties into the nineties of today. Like this is where the fourth act became like it's a thing you have to do. Yeah, yeah. To, much to the detriment of films, I think, because most of, people don't do it well. Yeah, it's not done very well. Mm -hmm. One thing we should talk about at this point. Uh, James Horner's score is killing Oh, it. so good. It's great. And by the way, did you notice, because we just did it, 
sounds a lot like Wrath of Khan. Yeah. There are a lot of Wrath of Khan elements. Because the story. military aspect of it all, what he we did Wrath of Khan, it was the naval aspect, and you have the military marine aspect in this one. So it makes sense to make these these pounding beats in the uh, one score. One of the things that's really one of the things that's always really fun as a lover of movie scores is when you work in animation. Uh, when editors put together an animatic for oh, the, the, an animated movie, score. they oh, always yeah. use temp score just to get to the tone because you haven't actually scored it yet. Right. And uh, and it's always fun for me to like watch an animatic, particularly with the editor who did it, and try and like call out sure. the movies. The score to Aliens gets used sure so much. <laughs> even I will say, I don't think this is a spoiler to say, but even in working on My Little Pony the movie, there are some sequences where we're watching it, and I was like, is that? The end of Aliens? And he's like, it's a great score, man. And I'm like, it is? I'm just really impressed that we worked this into My Little Pony. I'm t- Clearly, the My Little Pony Aliens connection I'm telling you. is so- real. Uh, Horner showed up in England thinking the film was done to start scoring. Uh, and they had six more weeks of shooting. Holy shit. And, they were st- and the editor was totally lost. And he couldn't do anything. And so he he wrote that score, that sequence that you're talking about in the final scene of the movie, basically the night before they recorded it in Abbey Road. Holy shit. Yeah. You know, and they were uh, Gail and Hurd, who is Cameron's producer, Mm -hmm. also his wife. uh, They were the you know, he was saying, I cannot do this in this time. And they went, well, we'll find someone who can. And they're threatening to fire him. And it was so terrible yeah. that Horn was like I will never work with James Cameron again which by the way a lot of people have said <laughs> he is a perfectionist he works people extremely hard and Horner didn't work with him again until Titanic where right. they made nice and then he did Avatar together I mean those are classic scores yeah, like yeah, Titanic example. and Avatar what terrible scores yeah. man oh the worst <laughs> yeah and that he's a big part he's a big part mm-hmm. of Aliens oh absolutely. for sure and then of course there's Newt's line what Newt says yeah. right at the end there once the airlock is closed the alien queen is thrown to oblivion and she says mommy yeah it's great you know and it's just it it, it it's an ultimate payoff yep yeah it's it's it's, it's a perfect which they perfect piss away moment. in alien 3 so fuck them well uh, but interestingly <laughs> enough i mean the thing about alien 3 that's fascinating is is it's almost the opposite of aliens you know not in, we, this is for a whole other day but aliens is a movie uh that was so thrilling the first time you watch it that over time you start to ask questions or right. maybe certain parts drag but it's still a great movie alien yeah. 3 to start off a movie killing two characters who we just, as we just right. discussed, built so much time yeah, falling in love with, it, you you are you are putting your audience in a place where they're not going to love your movie. Yep. Subsequently, years later, I've gone back and watched the oh. third Alien movie. And as yes. a film, once you let go of that, yes. there's actually a lot of beautiful stuff in it. It would mm-hmm. be a fun one to come back on and talk about another day because it's yeah. a beautiful film. But yeah... You don't kill Hicks and Newt, right. man. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? I get contract negotiations. Recast. Well, well, and it's it's there are certain things you do where your audience can be upset and go with you, and there are certain things you do where your audience goes, "Nope, yep. I'm out. Yep. You betrayed me." Yep. Which is which is interesting with this film because again, to, it's kind of where we started. Mm-hmm. But what this film does is take everything that's in the first film and completely honor it and embrace it, yeah. and do a different genre of film mm-hmm. without messing any of that up. Watching it, watching Aliens just doesn't make you not appreciate alien watching right. alien doesn't make you not appreciate aliens they're just one's a straight up horror science fiction movie and one is a straight up 80s action movie 80s yeah. action movie mm-hmm. yeah and it still works and a lot of the reason it works is just ripley as a character is one of the truly great great characters mm-hmm. of, not, not female characters of cinema great characters period yeah. absolutely and, and you know as you said at the beginning whatever sexist thing is going in much of hollywood that cannot see how to make heroic female characters is like, well, James Cameron's been doing it from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He understands how to do it. Yep. So, uh, Mike, what are your final thoughts on aliens? Uh, final thoughts on aliens are I want to go home and watch it again right now, even though I just recently (laughs) watched it. It is, is going through. It kind of makes you, uh, realize how, how powerful and amazing it is. And I think from a final thought standpoint, I think that it's something that a lot of action movies today could really go back and learn from, which is, it has thrills, it has action, it has scares, it has all that stuff, but at the core of it is actually just this really, really strong character relationship movie. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's the thing that more often than not, when we all go to see big summer movies, that's the part that's lacking for us. Yeah. And I think that James Cameron just nails it here. 
What about you, John? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with everything Mike said. Uh, I'm I'm such a massive fan of the film because of what it was able to do. It said at the beginning of the podcast, expanding the world of the original Alien, the 1979 uh, uh, original Alien movie. What it did in its way was create a slight art house film inside of an action movie because of the script, which I, uh, I highlighted earlier. The interactions with almost all the characters, there's never a wasted word, in my opinion. There's never a wasted second between them. Everything furthers the plot along. Everything furthers the connections between these characters so that when we feel them, when they die or when they succeed, when they live or when they get ripped in half by an alien queen, we feel that. You know, he made us care for Lance Hendrickson when he gets ripped in half. I was like, no, I remember screaming in the theater. Oh, yeah. No, when the whole time I've been back and forth. And that's the gift of this movie. The gift of this movie is that you are never 100 percent comfortable, no matter how, uh, how, no matter where you start and where you end. You are never 100 percent comfortable that you're out of the woods. And that's brilliant to keep you on the edge of your seat. Literally, the term edge of your seat is this movie. And actually, one thing that John just said that I think is 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 really important, which is, you know, we when you look at the history of cinema. Um, particularly geek cinema, mm. um, and you look at the great mythologies. You know, you look at the great from a brand standpoint. When you're yeah. looking at how can you extend a brand, how can you tell more stories within this brand? And what it really boils down to is, aside from stuff that is uh, source material, like a Harry Potter or something like that, there's very few stories and mythologies that were created solely in film that are so rich and so just mm -hmm. visceral that you just dive into it. And to John's point, this the way that aliens expanded this mythology of these eggs that are hatched by a queen and there's these hives. I mean, mm -hmm. aliens gave way to countless comic book adaptations mm -hmm. and novelizations that took place with either Ripley or the Marines or other characters that we'd never met before. And, you know, or predators kind of, and, and most famously mm -hmm. sort of combined with another one of the great monster alien mythologies, predator. Yeah. But like, you know, like that to those two mythologies, the aliens mythology, the predator mythology are two of the all time great sci-fi alien things yeah. out there that, that most yeah. movies that try and, you know, like take a movie like species or take a movie like mimic, uh, mimic. Yeah. you know, take these other movies that try and build this mythology around some alien monster or creature. And as far as that goes, aliens and predator are the gold standard. Yeah. I was just going to say all that, but he took it out of my mouth and claimed it for his own. <sighs> God. I, did say, I hate executives. I did say it was based on something I mean, you said. I just said it more clearly and more I, eloquently. I, that's yeah, all. Oh, no, that's it. Get out of here. Well, and, and, and I do want to say one last thing to wrap that up, what you were saying about all the mythology. The reason that we still have these films uh, and we have Alien Coven coming out this year is because of aliens. They have been trying to recapture that lightning in a bottle ever since aliens, in my opinion. And you know this because uh, we've discussed it. Uh -huh. I, as someone who's not that big of a fan of Prometheus, yes. I was not very excited about Aliens coming in. And even the first trailer yeah. felt more Prometheus than Aliens to me. Uh -huh. And it wasn't until uh, they released that four minute clip mm -hmm. of the crew talking where I looked to my brother and said, well, that feels like Aliens. Right. Now I'm more interested. Yeah. And then the new trailer itself as well makes it Absolutely. feel that way too. Well, that's what's so interesting with this Alien versus Aliens thing yeah is that because i've been thinking about this a lot is like is that alien is is a naturalistic art film yes in it's in its sort of style and that does not launch the franchise you know is that aliens taking it out of that sort of arty character driven atmospheric world into the uh, character driven is maybe not the right word into this um sort of bigger, more iconic action film, that's what would go, oh, we can build, we can go lots of different places mm -hmm. with this franchise mm -hmm. and adding things like the queen and the eggs that, you know, how that all works. Um, it's it's so interesting. Like, I will take the second half of Aliens over just about anything. Mm. I will, the first half of Aliens is where, to me, James Cameron's weaknesses as a writer sometimes come out. Mm. Um, not in a huge, is that he is... So your final thoughts are against my final thoughts completely. Mm, maybe not completely. I agree with a lot of what you said. I'm going to back slowly out of this room and let you two have this discussion. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Um, no, it's just, it's just, look, James Cameron has written some of the great iconic stories of all time. He is not my favorite screenwriter. No. Um, he is really a great idea guy, and I think he's a great structure guy. Yeah is that he really knows, like, this is where this character should be at this point. These are the moments that should happen between the characters. Yeah. When it comes to writing dialogue and writing characters who are have subtlety and nuance, that's not where he's so good. It's not, yeah. but I, I would actually... 
it's something that I often wonder about, and I, I don't disagree with anything you said, but I do find it fascinating that as opposed to say like the criticisms people would have towards George Lucas with the prequels. Mm. Oh, it's no comparison. Yeah. But you but like but but you say, okay, well George Lucas isn't a good writer, and that's apparent because the prequels are not as beloved uh as the originals for many. I mean, I know that there are a lot of people who are big prequel fans and I'm yes. not, I'm not going to say that the prequels are without merit, but in general you say those are not well-written and this is the Yes, thing. in general I'd yes. say that. With James Cameron movies, we all say this, well, well, James Cameron's not the best writer and I don't disagree with it, but he is, he is, he is hitting something. Yeah. And, 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 and hits it consistently over decades yep. that, that the, you know, like his scripts for these movies, like we'll all say, well, Titanic's kind of a cheesy script or Ugh, Avatar is Pocahontas meets Smurfs meets Dances with Wolves or like, yeah. you know, whatever you say. But every one of these movies, I mean, it's, it's not, I it's not seen, inaccurate. I, yeah, I hadn't thought about Smurfs, but there you go. Um, yeah. But like, but like every one of these movies, something in the structure, something in the way he sets it up, something in his characterization, despite the fact that he doesn't have the most naturalistic dialogue sometimes, still just... Mm -hmm. Bowls the world over. I 100% agree. Well, this is is that people think of writing as writing dialogue, just like people think of mm -hmm. acting as saying lines. Right. And it's like, that's a big part of it. And if you're in a David Mamet script or an Aaron Sorkin script, man, dialogue's really, really important. But right. that's not what all of... There were writers who wrote silent films that had no dialogue. Yeah. They're great writers. And so Cameron is great mm -hmm. at setting up story, advancing characters, structurally putting together, and coming up with ideas... Well, that are compelling. And yeah. ultimately, you know, we live in this world of, you know, every executive wants a four quadrant movie. Yeah. And I think that there's, there's, there's a magic to, I'm giving you all of the action and special effects of every other action movie, but I'm giving you a strong female protagonist. Right. Because the big thing you always talk about when you're in these executive meetings is, you know that the guys are going to go see the action movie. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm going to say the most sexist thing, but we all know that when executives all get in a room and talk, it's usually pretty sexist. But they say, we know that the boys are going to go to the action movie. Mm -hmm. And we know that the girls are going to go to the rom-com. But how do we get them all? And James Cameron, years ago, in a completely non-sexist way, non... Uh, didn't make a big deal out of it. Yeah, didn't make a big deal out of it, yeah. has created these stories that... No matter male, female, mm -hmm. whatever, there's there's something for you because there's these strong emotions, there's these strong female mm -hmm. characters, there's amazing special effects, there's awesome mythology. It's like all wrapped into one. Yeah. So that's what we think about aliens. Of course, we always want to hear what you think. You can visit our Facebook page, search for the Cinephile, C I N E dash F I L E S. Um, you can post your comments on iTunes. They move, mean a great deal to us. Mm -hmm. They really, really help. Um, and please subscribe to iTunes. You can subscribe on Stitcher, where we're C I N E no dash F I L E S. And now, now, for the first time, we are announcing that we have a YouTube channel. A YouTube channel. And you could come. You can't actually see us, no. but you can. But by the way, we look really good, right? It's true. It's true. Go to YouTube. Here's what I do right now because it's just started out. It's a little hard to search for. Yeah. Search for cinephiles with the dash, but put in Roca or Morris and yeah. it'll come up. Because yeah. there's some, we found out there's some other guys who did something called the cinephiles. They have some videos up there. You want to check them out too. They're kind of boring. They, yeah. And they don't look as good as us. Nope. No, no disrespect. No disrespect. I promise. Real, real good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, if you want to reach me, you can reach me at SR Morris on Twitter. John, where can they reach you? Oh, you guys can always reach me at The Roca Says, R-O-C-H-A, on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, yeah, always subscribe and, and comment because I like to uh, comment back and interact with you guys so much. And Mr. Vogel, would you like people to reach you on the interwebs? Of course. If you would love to talk to me about anything I said or argue with me about any of it, please feel free on Twitter at, at uh, MKToon, T-O-O-N. Uh, same on Instagram. Yeah. And it was so great having you. I'm so yeah, thanks, glad Mike. we did this. Thank you guys. This was awesome. I uh, again, super sad for the reason. Yeah. Uh, you know, very sad, very sad about Bill Paxton, but uh, best way to honor him is to watch all his amazing performances. So I'm going to yeah. go home and watch Aliens and True Lies and Predator 2 and everything else right now. <laughs> maybe, maybe we need to have a weird science party. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That would be great. Right. And uh, I have a feeling you're going to be back soon. I am going to come back yeah, for a, yeah. another movie that's a favorite of mine, and we're going to talk about it real, real soon. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. And that's it for this week. We will see you next time on The Cinephiles. <laughs>